action plan I have requested that officials bring forward is intending to drive that forward and to monitor how that is then effectively implemented across the country. Thank you. Uh, that ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Kenny McCaskill on the Jim Clark rally incidents. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Ken McCaskill, Cabinet Secretary, you've up to 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to make a statement about the fatalities that occurred near Swinton and the Borders last Saturday during the Jim Clark Memorial Rally. I know that the whole Chamber will wish to join me in expressing condolences to the families and friends of those who were killed or injured. Uh, the three spectators who died were John Leonard Stern, aged 71, from Bears Den, Elizabeth Allen, aged 63, from Barhead, and their partner Ian Proven, aged 64, also from Barhead. Above all, our thoughts are with their grieving families at this difficult time. It is important now that we give the bereaved all possible support, but also the time and privacy to grieve in peace and to make their funeral arrangements. The two casualties who were transferred to Edinburgh Royal Infirmary are continuing to receive ongoing care there. One is in a satisfactory condition and the other remains in a critical condition. And we all hope and pray that they'll both have a full and speedy recovery from their injuries. Just after 4 p.m. on Saturday afternoon, a rally car left the road at the Swinton section of the Jim Clark rally and collided with a number of spectators. Three people died and one was seriously injured. One casualty was later evacuated by air ambulance to Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. Earlier on the same day at around 2 p.m., another rally car left the road during a different stage, injuring six people. All six were taken to the Borders General Hospital for treatment. One of those injured was also subsequently transferred to Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. This incident came as a tremendous shock to that Berwickshire community and to the wider motorsport family. All across Scotland and far beyond, people are sharing the sadness of this tragic event and stand ready to offer whatever support they can. As the First Minister said on Saturday, this was desperately sad and difficult news for the Borders. People out for the weekend to enjoy their motorsport and to remember the achievements of one of the world's great racing drivers did not return home. That was the tragic outcome of this year's rally, an outcome that shook us all and that will live with us for years to come. Saturday was a black day for the rally, for the borders and for Scotland. But we must learn lessons and we will learn lessons. We need to understand what caused Saturday's fatalities and ensure that these tragic events in the borders will help us to make future rallies safer. The Lord Advocate and I went to Kelso yesterday to receive a briefing on Saturday's tragic events from Police Scotland and Scottish Borders Council. We were briefed on the event, the incident, the emergency response and the spectator safety arrangements. I also spoke at the weekend with David Parker, the leader of Scottish Borders Council about the incident and have met with the Council Chief Executive. All three emergency services, Police Scotland, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and the Scottish Ambulance Service, as well as the National Health Service and Scottish Borders Council, were involved in the immediate response to the incidents. Police Scotland family liaison officers have been deployed to support the next of kin of the deceased. And I would like to thank everyone who assisted in the response to this terrible incident. A full police investigation under the direction of the Crown uh, is now underway into the circumstances and a Police Scotland major investigation team is in place. Primacy lies with the investigation by the police. The decision on holding a discretionary FAI is for the Lord Advocate alone, as is any decision on whether criminal prosecution is appropriate. The Jim Clark Memorial Rally, which began on Friday, is a hugely popular annual event in the Borders, attended by thousands of spectators over three days. This year's rally commenced in Duns on Friday 30th May, moved to the Kelso area on Saturday, and was due to conclude at Duns on Sunday. Following the second incident, the Jim Clark Rally Executive Committee 
Scottish Borders Council and Police Scotland took a joint decision to abandon the rally and the final stages scheduled for Sunday were cancelled. Scotland has a strong tradition and a great history in motorsport. Jim Clark's name is up there alongside Sir Jackie Stewart, David Coulthard and the McRae family. The legacy of these sporting heroes is immense and has been proudly continued by the likes of Dario Franchitti, Alan McNish and Paul De Resta. And it is a fitting tribute to the late Jim Clark that the rally in his name has taken place in the Scottish border since 1970. It is the largest rally in the UK with some 250 competitors taking part. It is also the only rally in the UK mainland which takes place on closed public roads with many special stages over 310 miles. The Jim Clark Rally Limited is a company owned by the organisers, Berwickan District Motor Club Limited and Border Ecos Car Club Limited. The rally is organised by the Jim Clark Rally Executive Committee with assistance from Scottish Borders Council and the British Rally Championship and is one of seven rallies on the 2014 British Rally Championship calendar. The rally is organised in conjunction with the Motorsports Association. The MSA is the governing body in the United Kingdom and is responsible for the governance and administration of all major forms of motorsport in the UK, controlling the technical and sporting rules across the various disciplines. Rob Jones, the Chief Executive of the Association, has said that the incident will also be subject to full inquiries by the Association once the police investigation is concluded to ensure that any lessons are learned to assist in the constant drive to provide the highest possible safety standards at all motorsport events. I know that the Jim Clark Rally is a long-standing event that has been part of the local community for 44 years and has a good safety record. It is a hugely popular event that has brought enormous benefit to Berwickshire year after year. The Scottish Light Government receives an annual report from the organisers. This process allows a review of the effects of the rally on the grounds of public safety in order to ensure that lessons learned are carried forward for future. The legislation governing the rally was passed in 1996 and provides that ministers may either prohibit the holding of the rally or permit it, subject to certain terms and conditions. In the light of Saturday's events, the Minister for Transport will be giving careful consideration to the public safety aspects of the 2015 rally and the need for conditions. Clearly, this decision will be dependent on the information that comes forward from the safety reviews of the event. We have had discussions with Police Scotland about the need to review spectator safety more generally. We are moving into an unprecedented summer. The longer nights are with us, and with this in mind, I think it appropriate to review safety at public events and to do so very speedily. Across the country, there's a busy calendar of events and a huge amount of careful planning already done. While the Jim Clark Rally is unique as a closed road and unticketed motor rally, the Scottish Government will ask Police Scotland to work with event organisers and local authorities to undertake a health check of event planning for events taking place this summer. This will ensure that robust safety regimes and risk assessment procedures are in place and that licensing conditions are being met. Police Scotland have undertaken to carry out this review over the next four weeks. Spectator safety must always be paramount. In the light of the weekend deaths, the Scottish Government will commission a review of motorsport event safety in Scotland, drawing on safety experts and the knowledge and expertise of the motorsport community. The review will also include Scottish Borders Council, Police Scotland, the Motorsports Association, event organisers and other key stakeholders. It will include a review of the training and deployment of stewards, as well as all other safety-related controls. Scottish Ministers have the power to impose conditions on the rally and the Minister for Transport will wish to have sight of review of motorsport event safety recommendations before deciding whether to do so. Sadly, Scotland has seen human tragedies at sporting events in the past. 
We have come through those traumatic events, learned the hard lessons and acted on them so that, for example, our major sports stadia are now far safer for large crowds of spectators. That can be of small comfort to those who grieve today, but it is a, re a re process that is necessary and important. On behalf of this Parliament, once again, Presiding Officer and this country, I extend our deepest sympathies and condolences to those families of all three victims. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow, allow around about 20 minutes for the questions, after which we'll move on to the next business. It would be helpful if members wish to ask a question, would press the request to speak button now, and I call Graham Pearson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement today and associate Scottish Labour with the sentiments expressed by him uh, during that statement regarding this terrible tragedy. Uh, there are no doubt pressing questions that we would all like answers to, and I realise, uh, as many will in this chamber, that we must await the outcome of the police inquiries. Nevertheless, can he tell us who will lead on the longer-term government review of motorsport event safety and what timescales does he envisage for a report back to this chamber? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are currently inquiring as to who wishes to come on board on that. I've made it clear uh, to the chamber that we do intend it to be uh, wide, including the local authorities, those involved in motorsport, and we're seeking to obtain some expert advice. Uh, but government ministers will ultimately be in charge through uh, officials. Uh, obviously, we have to await the availability of some information that will be necessary for those who will be involved in that review. Uh, therefore, the timing is difficult to be precise because we have to ensure that the appropriate information is available, uh, can be released by the police and the Crown, uh, but it is certainly the intention to do so as expeditiously as possible, balanced with the necessity of making sure that we get it right. But I can give the member an assurance, given the manner in which he has asked and contributed to this, that we'll be more than happy to ensure that we engage with other political parties within the chamber, as well as with the broader stakeholders, to make sure that primacy is given to the police and to the Crown, that events, whether an FEI or thereafter, and that's for others, uh, can take place. But at the same time, we ensure that we get on with the review to ensure that motorsport, uh, which has provided benefits to Scotland, uh, can continue, but it does so in a manner which we can assure that those who go to watch it will not be endangered. John Lamont. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advanced copy um, of his statement? As the Cabinet Sec uh, Secretary stated, our thoughts and prayers are with the victims, their families and friends, and also for those who are still in hospital. We should also have thought to those spectators and marshals who witnessed the horrific scenes on Saturday afternoon. Clearly, it is welcome news that a full investigation will be carried out. However, can I urge caution against any knee-jerk reactions in terms of how we respond to this tra tra tragedy? This is a long-established event in the borders, and whilst everyone is shocked by the events at the weekend, I think it would be regrettable if any premature decisions were taken about the event's future. Furthermore, can the Cabinet Secretary assure me that there will be close cooperation with the Motorsport Association, the Berrican District Motor Club and the Border Cost Car Club to ensure that any additional controls are realistic and achievable to allow the continued running of this and similar events? Cabinet Secretary. I can give the member the assurance that we're not going to rush to judgment. As Mr uh, Pearson clearly indicated, there are those who are charged who require to carry out the investigation and they will do so. What we will ensure in this wider review is that those with skills and expertise are brought on board as part of that review. But I think the member may, does make a valid point, as I did reference in the initial statement. Scotland has a proud history uh, of those who have been very successful in motorsports, as well as those who have simply participated or indeed spectated and enjoyed enjoyed it. Uh, this event has run for 44 years without uh, any previous tragedy. Therefore, we have to ensure that we do not rush to judgment. We do have to ensure, though, that lessons are learned, and once those lessons are available to us, that they are implemented. But I can give uh, the member the assurance that those who are involved at the coal phase will be part of those discussions, not simply the operators in terms of the Jim Clark Rally uh, Limited, but also, more importantly, Scottish Borders Council and, indeed, other councils 
elsewhere in Scotland because although the Borders is significant in its input and contribution, not least with the late Jim Clark, many other areas in Scotland also welcome and benefit from this. Joe McAlpine, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you. I too would like to extend my deepest condolences to all those affected by this tragedy. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of why the rally continued after the first accident and whether there was any consideration given at that time to cancelling the rally? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, yes, this was a matter that was raised with the Lord Advocate and myself. Uh, the rally uh, does have a joint agency uh, basis, and there is a, a safety committee that includes not just the Jim Clark Rally Executive Committee, but also Scottish Borders Council and Police Scotland. Uh, after the first incident, incident, an investigation inquiry was made by all of those organisations who came to the conclusion that it appeared to have been a mechanical error, uh, that there was nothing intrinsically wrong with the site and it was on that basis that the rally uh, continued. Uh, so certainly it would appear that full consideration was given by all of those involved in the safety committee. It was something that was not related to the subsequent incident and did appear to relate to a mechanical failure on the vehicle and nothing to do with any safety related aspect of the route. Claudia Beamish followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I join with others across the Chamber today in expressing condolences and wishes for speedy recovery of those um, who were involved in, in this tragedy? And can I also ask the Cabinet Secretary um, what advice um, is to be given to spectator events, including such things as on-road cycle events this summer? In the meantime, um, while health checks, as, a, as are referred to in the Cabinet Secretary's statement, and the, the broader review proceed? Thank you. No, I, I welcome the, the member's contribution. That is clearly something that the government, and in particular the Cabinet Secretary for Sports and Commonwealth Games, uh, is very concerned about. That is why we have engaged with Police Scotland. We have no reason to believe that there is anything untoward. Uh, many of these are, events have already uh, been properly scrutinised, not simply by the police, but by local authorities. But after discussion with DCC Ian Livingston, it has been made clear that Police Scotland will carry out this investigation over a period of four weeks. They will report back. As I say, they already uh, believe that there has been proper investigation and nobody should be under any cause or fear or alarm. But I think after having seen what occurred at the weekend, it is right and proper that this quick review is carried out to provide as much assurance as we can that those who will be going to events over coming weeks, uh, large or small, uh, whether relating to cycling, motorsport or anything else, uh, can be assured that they will be as safe as they can be. Christine Graham, followed by Elaine Murray. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, too, would extend my condolences to an area that I used to represent in that part of the borders. Can I, I, I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that this is not a circumstance where a mandatory FAI uh, should be held, but could I respectfully suggest to the Lord Advocate, I know he's not here, but to hear this, that I think this is where we must have an FAI, and given that they take so long, that this should be done expeditiously. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, the member is quite correct. It is a, a, a discretionary FAI, but obviously the Lord Advocate has taken a uh, special interest in this, travelling down yesterday not only to be briefed by the Council and indeed the Divisional Commander and uh, uh, Gold Commander at the time, but also to visit the Locuses. It will be for him. It is his discretionary uh, aspect, but I think I can give the member the assurance uh, that the Lord Advocate will seek to deal with this matter as expeditiously as possible and is giving it his own uh, personal investigation. Elaine Murray, followed by Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, I'm sure that all our thoughts are with the victims uh, of the, and the, 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 this tragedy and their families. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I understand that there is an, in existence a motorsport safety code, and the, the programme for the event actually made reference to that. Will the review of the motorsport event safety, which the Scottish Government is commissioning, include the way in which this code is disseminated to spectators and volunteers at events? Well, yes, I think clearly the member makes a valid point there. Some of these aspects will clearly come out uh, in the investigation and indeed whether uh, in an FAI or not. But there are aspects that do have to be reflected and reviewed upon. It's for that reason that the review that we are setting up will include those who currently have expertise, but also others who can perhaps take a fresh perspective to ensure that the expertise is as up-to-date as it can be and takes into account all appropriate criteria, including information that will come to light for the investigation. So I think I can give that, the, the member that assurance. 
Jim Hume, followed by Claire Adamson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for making this statement to the Parliament. Our thoughts too are with the relatives and friends of those who have tragically died on a day which should have been about enjoying their sport and also to those, of course, who are still injured. And I think it's appropriate to also recognise the emergency services who had to deal with this tragedy. The, the, Minister, the Cabinet Secretary was correct. This is the 44th Jim Clark rally. And no, we know it brings in an annual local spend of £3.3 .3 million, but safety and precaution of life must be paramount. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise whether now is an appropriate time to look at how rallies are resourced on the ground in terms of stewards and spectator, spectator safety? and will also support counselling of those who may have traumatic stress after this tragic event. Uh, well, I think there's two separate items here. I think the member himself said it's a matter of balance, and I would agree with that. Clearly, I think we require to learn the lessons, and it requires to be taken on board. We have to balance uh, the great enjoyment, the benefit uh, and prestige that has gone, as well as the benefits to the local community in terms of income, with public safety that always has to be paramount, but lessons uh, will be learned there. In terms of post-traumatic stress disorder, that is a matter that has already been raised with me by uh, my colleague. Paul Wheelhouse and I'll happily engage with Scottish Borders Council regarding that. I don't think this is a, an event perhaps where it's it would be for the Victim Support Scotland but there are other resources available and we will engage with the Council and indeed with other agencies to see what can be done. But clear, clearly there were people who were present, doubtless saw uh, the tragedy unfold before their eyes and may very well require treatment. Claire Adamson followed by Jackson Carlaw. Presiding officer, can I also associate myself with the condolences expressed my, by my colleagues this afternoon in the chamber and thank the Cabinet Secretary for his statement. I'm a convener of the Cross-Party Group on Accident Prevention and Safety Awareness, which has previously considered both road safety and safety in leisure and sporting activities, and indeed many of its members will have been directly affected by this tragic event. Are there any indications at this early stage of the key lessons to be learned in terms of accident prevention and safety awareness and can the Cabinet Secretary express how those lessons will be imparted both to professionals and the wider safety community? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think we are intent that it will be imparted through the review group that will report back and members will be made available. I think it would be premature. Clearly, police officers have been at the scene, especially road traffic officers. Uh, there will also be the ongoing investigation, as I remember, in which uh, the Motorsports Association will be taking part. I think we have to leave it to those who have expertise to uh, ensure that the site is properly examined. Time was taken, including, as I say, uh, ensuring that the bodies were removed with dignity. So lessons are currently being uh, learned. Uh, the circumstances are being looked at by those with the expertise over many years. But what I can confirm to the member is that those lessons, once learned from those experts, will be imparted across. And we would expect, as an administration, for them to be taken on board by all who have a responsibility for running an organisation of such events. Jackson Carlo, followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As someone who came from a family business that had within it a motorsport division that entered and won rally races across Scotland, can I say I share the dismay of all those who love motorsport in Scotland today and I add my condolences to those who have lost their lives, particularly the West of Scotland constituents uh, in Barhead. Um, you're right, Cabinet Secretary, to say that this event has an exemplary track record, but the code that many people observe actually arose out of previous tragedies that occurred, albeit many years ago. And I wonder, as well as looking at what fresh uh, safety advice might be required, we look, or those looking at this, also look to see whether, in fact, a degree of complacency may have grown simply because of the absence of accidents in recent years, and that, in fact, the advice we have is very robust but needs to be properly uh, implemented to ensure safety at these events. I think the member does make a fair point. It is for that reason that the review will not simply concentrate on the Scottish borders, because we are aware that there was a tragedy up in the north of Scotland just a year or so ago that related to a motorsport event. <laughs> so lessons have to be learnt in every locality. Uh, I, I cannot speculate as to whether or not there was complacency. What I can say is that the Motorsports uh, Association and those involved with the running of this rally, uh, I think, are deeply shocked by this, uh, are quite willing to cooperate in its certainly our intention to go forward in a manner of learning lessons, seeking to make sure that they are taken on board and that the appropriate lessons will be properly implemented by those charged, whether Police Scotland, local authorities or indeed the event organisers. Gordon MacDonald, followed by John Pentland. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also add my condolences to those people affected? Can the Cabinet Secretary provide the Chamber with further information on the response by the emergency services on the day to this terrible incident? Well, I thought the response was outstanding. Obviously, Police Scotland were there. They were part of the uh, organisation, and indeed fire and rescue, and indeed ambulance were also there because these events, as many events, whether music festivals or indeed sporting events such as this, uh, do have great implications for crowd safety. Uh, plans and preparations are always made. Hopefully, and in most instances, they never require to be implemented. But clearly, Police Scotland were on the scene at the time of the second incident. It was agreed by all parties that the rally should be cancelled uh, forthwith, uh, and that allowed fire and rescue, uh, ambulance services, and indeed Scottish Borders Council, along with the police, uh, to do their job. And again, uh, presiding officer, I would put on record uh, my gratitude and thanks to what must have been a very distressing incident for those, although it is their job and what they're trained to do, to have to deal with three fatalities as well as the consequences. John Pentland and then finally John Mason. Cabinet Secretary, the review may well result in additional responsibilities being placed on local authorities with regard to sporting events, for example, with regard to risk assessment and safety procedures. Can I get the assurance that any such duties will be fully funded by the Scottish Government? I think it would be premature for me to rush to judgment. I mean, I know how uh, Scottish Borders Council welcomed the rally, but equally how they're conscious about the safety. They welcome the rally because not only does it provide good fun that many of their residents uh, uh, contribute to and participate in, but it also brings a great deal of benefit into the local community. I think this isn't a matter of pounds, shillings and pence. We can't put any evaluation on the price of the, uh, those that we have lost. What I can say is that every organisation, national or local government, council or indeed uh, private consortia, has an obligation to ensure that public safety is paramount and no price or safety can be put upon that. John Mason. Hey, thank you. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can assure us that there has been or there will be engagement, full engagement with the local community and that any views they have about the future will be taken into account. Uh, well, absolutely. That's why on the Sunday I phoned the leader of Borders Council and indeed on the Monday, along with the Lord Advocate, we met with the Chief Executive and members of staff. That liaison relationship will continue. Uh, we appreciate that this has deeply affected many locally and that's why arrangements have been made for those who wish to pay tribute to lay flowers can do so. Uh, but we will work with uh, Scottish Borders Council and indeed Borders uh, Health Service uh, to do what is necessary to support the local community as well as to support Support the families elsewhere and throughout Scotland uh, who are grieving. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Justice Secretary. We move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10185 in the name of Keith Brown on air passenger duty. Members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request speak buttons now. And I'll give a few seconds for people to reorganise themselves. And can I say to members who are taking part in the debate, we have a wee bit of time in hand, so we will be slightly generous if you uh, take interventions. I see the Minister is now ready. I call on Keith Brown to speak to move the motion. Minister, 30 minutes. Thank you, President Officer, and I uh, welcome the opportunity to come to the Chamber today to restate the strong case that we have set out for control of air passenger duty coming to Scotland. As members will be aware, our proposals for APD enjoy widespread support, including from Scotland's airports and a growing number of airlines. And our case for Scotland having control of APD is based on the facts. While Scotland has a decent return in terms of its European network, we do continue to play catch-up in relation to longer-haul international connectivity. Our strategic approach is to work with our airports to entice more direct international services but also to improve connectivity where we have to do that to hub airports. And there have been some notable successes recently. Edinburgh's new routes to Chicago and Doha are prime examples of airports and the government working together to secure success. But these successes have happened despite the current application of APD, and Scotland's airports are absolutely, absolutely clear and unanimous in this that APD is a barrier to further success. 
I also believe that what Scotland has to offer um, in terms of its tourism uh, places it in the heavyweight bracket. It's clear, though, that APD is having a severe impact on the ability of our tourism industry to punch at its proper weight. And the rationale is straightforward. More direct international flights make it easier to attract more tourism to our country and to increase our share of that vital market. A stark illustration of the effect of the burden of air passenger duty is that together with other burdens, such as VAT, the UK as a whole, despite the excellence of the cultural offerings which we can make, is rated by the World Economic Forum as the 139th least competitive tourism country from a list of 140. The country occupying 140th place is Chad. Our tourism industry is geared for success and its unmatched natural and human resources to work with. But when a family of four travelling to Scotland from North America are presented with an excess of £276 on their airfare, other parts of Europe can start to become a better alternative. Uh, notwithstanding changes announced in the last UK budget, which I'll touch on shortly, uh, research work conducted in 2012 estimated that increases in APD rates between 2007 and 2011 could result in a loss of 2.1 million passengers to Scotland's main airports every year by 2016. And that same report concluded that in the five-year period from 2007, rates for short-haul flights had increased by around 160% and long-haul by up to 360%. These figures in 2014 now stand at 160% and 385% respectively, and there can be no justification for that level of rise. Furthermore, a separate piece of independent economic modelling carried out in 2013 concluded that abolishing APD could provide the UK with a short-run increase in GDP of almost half of 1%, rising investment and rising employment, and a permanent boost in GDP into the medium term. And it's worth thinking for a moment about the effect uh, of, of APD in increasing carbon emissions. Many people now actually go to Dubai via Dublin rather than fly direct from Scotland because it costs them more to do that with APD. So we add on a short haul environmentally damaging flight uh, onto the actual flight itself. So APD uh, is working against our targets in terms of climate change as well. Uh, for some time, APD has been at the top end of the most expensive aviation duties in Europe, with significant annual rises bucking the European trend. Indeed, there appears to be a growing uh, realisation amongst our European neighbours of the negative economic impact which air passenger taxes can have. Uh, the Irish government, for example, abolished their €3 Euros airport travel tax uh, in April. It's also worth saying that the APD that we have is the most expensive tax of its kind in the world. Uh, and we can compare uh, the effect which you'd have in Ireland from the, th the reduction of APD with the reduced offering at some Scottish airports. And we shouldn't forget the importance of the economy of our airports in their own right and the vital importance of their success. They are major employers in their areas, both directly and through contractors. Glasgow Airport, for example, employs over 400 staff directly, whilst contractors and service providers boost that figure to indirectly employing 4,500. We also need to recognise, therefore, that successful airports are themselves catalysts for economic development and, do, and we should do everything that we can to support that ambition. Uh, despite some of the misgivings, uh, misgivings we've seen on opposition benches for uh, our strong desire, rather, for Scotland to have control of APD, is not based really just on the idea of power for the sake of power. It's based on a, a problem which we've identified, which is widely observed in the industry, and which was also recognised by the Common Commission in June 2009 which the UK government has had ample opportunity to deal with. It's chosen not to deal with it. Uh, you remember the Common Commission presiding officer also further suggested that uh, air passenger duties should be devolved, especially if it was devolved, to Northern Ireland, which it's now been. Uh, but there are no reasons, uh, no adequate explanation given as yet for not dealing with it in Scotland. And for some time it's been apparent that UK government aviation policy has been, if we can call it, Heathrow-centric. In an APD context, the captive market which Heathrow represents makes it easier to charge APD at whatever rate suits the exchequer. Yeah. Uh, I have long argued that regional airports don't have that luxury and have drastically different uh, capacity and demand issues. And it's therefore just common sense to acknowledge that a one-size-fits-all policy will not work. Uh, the UK government appears to have only partly seen the merits of that argument uh, in relation to Northern Ireland. 
And the recent changes in the UK budget betray the UK Government's singular focus. The reduction from four bands to two represents a tangible and immediate benefit for existing and soon-to-be-introduced long-haul services. And with that in mind, it would be no, no surprise to see the current direction of travel continue, whereby Heathrow looks to optimise its restricted capacity by encouraging more long-haul services at the expense of regional ones. And when APD is charged on both sectors of a domestic service, the disincentive to airlines is also clear. The continuing squeeze which is seen on our Heathrow connections and the barrier to enhanced international connectivity which APD has provided uh, currently applies uh, for uh, currently comprises uh, something of a double whammy uh, to passengers. The UK budget changes could, in theory, add more potential to future discussions with the Chinese and other long-haul markets, but has little impact on the present. Our airports do not currently have direct scheduled services falling into the upper two bands for which the rates are being reduced. The MD of one of our larger airports told me recently that the changes affect around 4% of his business. The impact at Heathrow and Gatwick, of course, will be much more significant. Recognising the need for quick but also considered action, our commitments for APD in Scotland's future deal with the short term and the future. We are committed to a 50% reduction in the first term of an independent Scottish Parliament with full abolition at a time when public finances allow. It is Scotland focused and it does not have to reconcile unintended consequences at Heathrow or other large UK airports. That continues to be an insurmountable challenge apparently for the UK Government. These are recognised throughout the industry as radical proposals, but absolutely necessary for the position that we find ourselves in. That is a view shared by the industry. Scotland's airports have been supportive of APD control coming to Scotland for some time. Indeed, I had a call today with one of the airlines, Flybu, called to say that they wish us all the best in this debate and hope for widespread support also amongst the opposition parties in relation to this. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce and other business organisations agree. Willie Walsh, the Chief Executive of BA's parent group, suggests that APD would be dealt with in a more progressive manner in an independent Scotland, and the UK Government would be well advised to listen to that. I also note the position taken previously by Ruth Davidson that APD should be abolished and also the Liberal Democrats' position on federalism. So we have, I think, maybe uh, the grounds for some consensus in Parliament. Although it's quite a confused picture, because I understand yesterday uh, that despite the fact that the Carmen Commission, which the Conservatives supported, hasn't taken any action on its own recommendation, uh, Ruth Davison felt it necessary to restate her support, uh, as I understand it, uh, for the de devolution of APD, although that's since been contradicted in a report in The Guardian today. She's also mentioned that she sought its abolition from David Cameron, who point blank refused. And what a perfect example of why we have to have independence in this country, when a vital change that even the Conservatives agree should happen is just dismissed out of hand by the UK Prime Minister. So perhaps uh, later on in the debate we'll get some more certainty as to the Liberal Democrat position. We've also, it's from the Conservative position, but in relation to the Liberal Democrats, we had a statement before, of course, from the uh, Secretary of State for Scotland saying this would be happening. And lo and behold, it's not happened. So perhaps we can get some uh, consensus or some, uh, some clarity from the Liberal Democrats in relation to that, and also how uh, their refusal to move on this uh, is reconciled with their position on federalism. Uh, I note in relation to the Labour Party's, but yes, I will do. Alison McKellis. You, you asked for clarity. Perhaps we could have some clarity from you. I mean, yesterday we learned that the SNP proposed to increase benefit for carers by £58 million. Uh, given that wasn't included in the page of costings in the white paper, can you tell me if that policy comes before or after ABPD in the queue for money? Minister. So a request from me from clarity from the Liberal Democrats evokes a response asking for clarity about a childcare policy. I think really, really you could answer the question. Perhaps you can use your own time to answer the question in relation to the question which I asked rather than avoid it in the way that you have done. And also, if you look at the Labour Party's position, that's changed quite dramatically between April 2013 and March 2014. Originally, the proposal was to support uh, devolution of APD, and that's changed in the latest devolution proposals. I don't know what the rationale for that is, but perhaps we can have some clarity on that in relation uh, to this debate subsequently. I have to say that uh, those uh, not currently in favour of control of APD coming to Scotland are swimming against the tide. We've laid out the reasons why it's important that Scotland should have control over this tax. It's quite uh, clear from the York Aviation Study and other studies which have been done that the cost to Scotland has been estimated, I think, at 2014 levels, of around £200 million per year. And we know, we know it's the case that in Southern America, North America, people 
people are looking at this and they're saying to themselves, flights from Mexico, the examples I've been given, entire plane loads of people taking a decision rather than coming uh, to the UK and to Scotland will decide instead to go to Paris or other European capitals, citing two reasons, one of which is APD and the other is in relation to visa controls. Now, there is real cost here because those people, had they come to this country, would spend money in our shops, in our hotels, in our restaurants to the benefit of the people of Scotland, and that's no longer happening. And I think the £2 billion, which I think the York Aviation Study uh, mentioned across the whole of the UK, is a huge figure and a huge loss. We can boost jobs, we can boost the economy, we can, come back, uh, we can cut back on some of the very expensive uh, uh, um, connecting flights, which we currently have to have, by having more direct flights. And for that reason, President Officer, I'm happy to move the motion in my name that uh, control of our APD is passed to the Scottish Parliament. Thank you very much. I now call on Mark Griffin to speak to and move Amendment 10185.2. Mr Griffin, you have nine minutes, a generous nine minutes. Thank you, President Officer. What we have here is another day and another debate on independence. Once again, we talk about powers and process when we could be talking about reducing poverty and inequality. Another debate where the end result will be that SNP MSPs vote one way, we vote another way, and not a single thing changes in Scotland in terms of transport connectivity. We have thought long and hard about air passenger duty, and we are still unconvinced about removing it. We have discussed it through the Cameron Commission and introduced it for debate in our Devolution Commission. And while we feel that air passenger duty is in need of reform, a 50% reduction in total removal just wouldn't be sensible without further consideration of the economic and environmental impact. Certainly. Mr Keith Brown. I can say then why it was a point of principle for the Common Commission to agree that it should be devolved. I understand he might quibble with the proportion at which it's cut, but how is the principle that it should be devolved to Scotland changed from the conclusions that Labour reached during the Common Commission? Well, the point of principle is, is that we need to take into account the economic assessment, environmental assessments, which I will go on to try and cover some of that in my speech. But I think from first, first principles, you need to um, make those judgments and take those assessments into account before you decide where the tax is best administered. We are not closing the door to devolution to Scotland, but we think that further consideration is required before a decision like that is taken. And I do not think um, the, the Scottish Government seem somehow surprised by that, but we just can't remove what is an environmental levy without considering those impacts thoroughly. Um, it, sorry, it, it's no surprise that the SNP want this power over tax, since the Government um, are an all centralising force here in Edinburgh. I never missed that opportunity to demand more powers. We have to look deeper at what the Government want this power for, though. Um, when we look at those reasons, then we see that um, SNP Tory Alliance, two parties propose devolution of air passenger duties, two parties propose tax competition across the UK, with the benefits going to big airlines and the cost being borne by the public purse and the environment. It is a, a debate which is a mirror image of the one on corporation tax, where the Scottish Government pursue a low tax economy while claiming that they are a progressive force. Yep. Thank you. I thank the, uh, Mr Griffin for giving way. I am just wondering, in terms of uh, what is Mr Griffin and the Labour Party's views on the, both the York Aviation Report, which showed the devastating effect that APD has on uh, Scottish airports, and also the PricewaterhouseCoopers Report, which actually went into some detail uh, into the economic advantages of actually scrapping APD across the UK, I should say. Give you extra time, Mr. There has been a failure of the government to have any assessment in this policy before it is introduced. The papers the, the member mentioned, I agree that there would be an increase in passengers coming to the UK. That would be a, a, a benefit. But similarly, the member has to appreciate that there would be an increase in passengers leaving the UK. And so home-based um, revenue for tourism would surely be affected as well. Surely that, that, make, that makes sense. Um, but what is progressive at all about that 
tax cut to big business of £135 million through that reduction of air passenger duty, on top of the £385 million given back to big business through a, a cut in corporation tax 3% lower than even George Osborne is proposing. And that's over half a billion pounds of a tax break to big business on day one of Scottish independence. And no answer from the Scottish Government on where those cuts will fall on public spending. Let's look at the detail of the proposal, though. The Scottish Government have said that the costs of reducing APD could be offset by increased VAT receipts as a result of increased tourism. Apart from the fact that this revenue would go to the UK Treasury, and that, that seems to be the reason the Scottish Government aren't introducing their childcare policy, but we can leave that inconsistency for another day. Um, it's been indicated that a 50% reduction in air passenger duty would increase passengers by 3%. A 3% increase in inward passengers would generate additional income and revenue in Scotland. But is it enough to offset that £135 million in lost revenue? And similarly, as I said earlier, we were predicting an increase of 3% in visitors. Surely logic dictates that we'd expect a 3% increase on Scots flying out. How much would it cost the Scottish economy and the public purse if more Scots decide to go on foreign holidays rather than stay and visit UK destinations. I have yet to see any detailed figures produced by the Scottish Government on the likely impact of the policy, other than what we know for certain, which is that the public purse will be £135 million worse off. And I wonder if the Minister can say today, then, in the interest of transparency ahead of the referendum, which public services would be cut or who would be paying higher taxes to fund that? Will it be the teachers, nurses or police, local government or care for the elderly? The Scottish Government can have no credibility on this issue when it has no costings and not willing to say yeah, yeah. where spending will be reduced or taxes increased. Now, Members that's not, not taking intervention that's from not you, to Mr say that we are opposed to reform of air passenger duty. I just think that when it is considered, the full implications of any reform should be known. I think also it should be remembered that air passenger duty was introduced as an environmental levy. The White Paper makes a clear commitment to decarbonisation. Now, how are these two policies consistent? The White Paper states that we will be able to align transport policy with energy policy to achieve Scotland's ambitious decarbonisation tactic. It targets under Section 33 of the Climate Change Scotland Act the Scottish Government has made a commitment to reduce carbon emissions by 46% on 1990 levels by 2020, with a further reduction of 80% on 1990 levels by 2050. That was a target unanimously backed by this Parliament. The Act also requires the Scottish Government to hit annual emission targets um, and report back to Parliament. Both of those targets have been missed, making the subsequent targets more difficult to hit. And in, the, in, their annual report on in their annual report on po proposals and policies, the Scottish Government has also been criticised by opposition parties and a number of environmental organisations for having too many proposals and not enough policies. Criticisms such as basing long-term goals on vague assertions such as new technology being available in the future. It seems strikingly similar that in this debate, the Government can only offer those vague assertions, again, that everything would be OK. No costings to consider, no figures for how much they would be offset and in the context of the environmental impact and carbon reduction targets, and no proposals for any reform of air passenger duty to reduce carbon emissions from air travel. President officer, this debate is essentially about transport connectivity. But as with everything else, it's about transport connectivity and an independent Scotland. At the start of my con contribution, I said that nothing will change after today. It will simply carry on as we were. That wouldn't be the case if the government are serious about transport connectivity. 
we could have been debating the actions and the options the Scottish Government have today, right now, to make Scotland a more connected place and a more attractive place to come and visit for business or leisure. This Government could be well on the way to delivering a rail link to Glasgow Airport, boosting one of our most important city regions. But here we are again, talking about powers and process and a continuation of this Government's independence agenda of tax cuts for big business. I move the amendment in my name, President Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Alex Johnston. Speak to and move Amendment 10185.1. Mr Johnston, a generous six minutes. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I start by moving the amendment that stands in my name, lest I forget to move it at the end. What a terrible error that would be. I start from a position of enormous advantage in this debate, and that is because I was brought up to believe that all tax was evil. And my experience... My experience of a career in politics has only tempered that slightly in that I now believe that tax may be a necessary evil, but evil nonetheless. And occasionally a tax comes along which causes everybody to round on it and attack it because of the damage it's doing. And air passenger duty is exactly that kind of tax. So it's no surprise that we find ourselves here today debating APD, once again having debated it, I believe on the 20th of November 2012, and to be perfectly honest, not a great deal has changed in the interim. And one of the things that hasn't changed in the interim is the fact that the SNP are still desperately trying to quote from the York Aviation Report. The only difference is that uh, a year and a half down the line, it is demonstrated to be out of date and unworthy of our concern. However, I will go into some more detail uh, on that. If you consider that the report said, uh, or it claimed, that increases in rates of uh, air passenger duty could result in 2.1 million passengers being lost to Scotland, and by 2016, 210 million less pounds would be spent in Scotland per year by inbound visitors. Yeah, it also suggested that the initial doubling of APD in 2007 uh, had had an effect uh, at that time of reducing 1.2 million passengers uh, over the country. However, in terms of the knock-on effect, it predicted that the Scottish economy as a result of ADP uh, air passenger duty uh, would lose inward investment, trade and competitiveness. Yet, if we look at the figures that have actually been produced since then, Glasgow Airport in 2013 handled 7.4 million passengers, up from 7.2 million in 2009, bucking the trend of the predictions in the York Aviation Report. Edinburgh uh, had 9.2 million passengers, up from 9 million in 2009. So these figures would appear to indicate that there is a growing trend. That trend is at its greatest in Aberdeen, where uh, they handled 3.5 million passengers in 2013, compared with only 3 million in 2009. So it would appear, even with the recession which we've gone through, the predictions of the York Aviation Report did not actually materialise. Nevertheless, I found myself sitting through uh, the Minister's initial uh, opening uh, contribution to this debate, agreeing with a great deal of what he said in terms of economic impact of taxation. Yes, very briefly. Alan Keir. I thank uh, Mr Johnson for the intervention. Um, given that he's a, 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 a fine-dyed-in-the-wool Tory, uh, would he uh, not agree with going by his own political judgment in the past and whatever, that perhaps the change of ownership, the competition aspect uh, in terms of Edinburgh Airport particularly might just have uh, uh, helped matters in terms of uh, the numbers. There you Mr. go. Uh, a positive contribution made from outside Scotland. Uh, let, let's, now, let's now look uh, at what we're actually saying in terms of this tax, what it was meant to do and the effect it's having. Of course, we all know that it was initially uh, put forward as a green tax. It was meant to tax those who were uh, travelling by air and uh, polluting as a result. It's now simply considered as a revenue-raising measure. But at the same time, 
we should never make the mistake of believing that taxing people out of the air is likely to cause positive effects in terms of environment. Because as we all know, not only have passenger numbers increased in recent years, but predictions that airlines would not invest in newer, cleaner aircraft have also turned out to be wrong. The result is that the emissions from our aircraft, especially measured per passenger, are now dropping very quickly as fleets are renewed and efficiency is improved. But a key part of that is that larger aircraft will tend to travel from hubs and as a result we in Scotland will rely as we have always done on feeder services to these major hubs rather than uh, hoping that we can bring all these services directly into Scotland. The, consequ the consequence of that is that we must concern ourselves about the air passenger duty not only being paid in Scotland but that that is paid in London too. So, as I stand here, I'm willing to hold out the olive branch and say that, yes, the Cullman Commission said that air passenger duty should be devolved. Yesterday, the Strathclyde Commission, the Conservative Party's document which sets out what we are prepared to do in the event of a no vote, a detailed document which goes into great length about the generous proposals for devolution that we will have in that event. Yet one small part of it, the part that said we would like to see APD devolved, is the one that the SNP are getting most excited about. But what they miss is that devolving APD, even if we were to abolish it all, and not just the 50% that they've committed to uh, during the lifetime of the first parliament, what they miss is that the only way we can get rid of APD, rid Scotland of APD, is to abolish it on a United Kingdom basis so that Scottish passengers don't have to pay it at the London end as well as the Scottish end. Briefly. Chuck Brodie, briefly. John, John, thank you for giving away. Why it's OK to uh, give the power to Northern Ireland in terms of reducing a APD and not Scotland? The irony of Chick Brodie's position is that he takes the place of the unionist, the man who looks from the centre and believes that everything should be equal in all directions. I take the position of the politician who believes in devolution. I believe in different solutions for different countries. And that's why I, as a true devolutionist, who believes in decision-making right here in Scotland, I'm prepared to propose that we, as two political parties with so much that separates us, reach out and link hands going forward together for the benefit of Scotland and its air passengers in order to secure in the long term a sound commitment that this evil tax will ultimately be a burden removed and not one that we have to suffer any longer. Gosh. I now call on Patrick Harvey. Six minutes or thereby, Mr Harvey. How do I follow that? I think I can only reflect, Deputy Presiding Officer, that I, I think I must have been raised with a fundamentally different understanding of the word evil than Alex Johnson. I was raised with an understanding that the decisions we make collectively to provide the public services that we all depend on, an investment in the future, and indeed, hopefully in future, struggling towards a more sustainable economy, these are profoundly to the good, uh, and uh, nothing could be further than the truth than to call that kind of approach evil. Given that that's uh, the, the starting point, I've got a great deal of sympathy with the arguments Mark Griffin was making, not just about whether this would be a good change or a bad change in aviation terms, in transport connectivity terms, but how is it to be paid for? Uh, and just as uh, we've reached agreement, I think, uh, on that, that uh, between Labour and the, the Greens on uh, the government's approach to cooperation tax, the same argument applies here. If the government wishes to cut a tax, it's going to have to say where that revenue will be replaced from other taxation or where it will be cut from the budget. But in looking at the question about... Uh, yeah. Brody. And 
And thank you for taking the intervention. Microphone, well, Mr Brodie. Sorry, I wanted to ask Mr Griffin. Can you tell me why we have to replace the taxes when in the Netherlands they got rid of APD because it was attracting 250 million euros and yet they were losing 750 million in tourism and VAT? Why do we have to replace the tax? Patrick Harvey. Well, if you stop raising a tax, then you've got less income coming to the public budget, and that's going to have to be cut from somewhere. To, to move on to this question about whether cutting or even abolishing air passenger duty uh, is a good idea, I think we have to begin with a comparison to other transport modes and an acknowledgement that the aviation industry already enjoys massive tax breaks compared with other transport modes. Since 1947 and the Convention on International Civil Aviation, uh, as well as many EU directives and EU-US trade deals since then, the aviation industry has paid no fuel duty. No fuel duty compared to every other transport mode which pays some taxation on its fuel. A aviation... No, I'll, I need to move on. I've, I've taken one already. Uh, aviation also enjoys... Uh, it's covered by VAT, but it's zero-rated in this country. Consumers pay no VAT on tickets. Uh, airline fuel is zero-rated, and no VAT is due on the purchase of new aircraft, aircraft servicing, air traffic control, baggage handling, aircraft meals, and many other aspects of this industry. So these massive tax breaks which this industry already enjoys. Can we, can we figure out how much they are? Well, the UK government, the UK government with whom I would not agree on many things, has made an assessment uh, uh, saying that uh, were the UK to charge a fuel duty and VAT on tickets, this could result in revenues of around £10 billion. That estimate was from 2008. £10 billion. Now, I'm not suggesting that those are things which one country can unilaterally do that those changes wouldn't be effective if one country unilaterally embarked upon them. But we do need to begin with an acknowledgement of the scale of the tax break that this industry enjoys. But is its taxation through air passenger duty still too much of a burden? Too much of a burden to bear, holding the industry back? Well, I don't think so. I had to look at the uh, increases that we've seen just recently. Aberdeen Airport... Uh, in 2013, had apparently its busiest year in history, beating the record high uh, from before the economic downturn, seeing 3.48 million people pass through that airport in 2013. Glasgow Airport uh, has enjoyed its busiest year since 2008, uh, after seeing 7.4 million uh, passengers through its doors in 2013. That's a 2.9% increase. And Edinburgh... Uh, which has been mentioned already, 9.8 million people thereabouts used Edinburgh Airport in 2013. That's an increase of 6.3%, beating the global average of increase of the aviation industry, most of which is seeing its increases in uh, more rapidly developing countries. And so this remains a very uh, expansionist industry. It's a very profitable industry. Just a few days ago, Published profit forecast for the airline industry globally uh, said that the airlines are expected to make in excess of £10 billion profit. Uh, and European airlines uh, made some £240 million, uh, in 2012, £300 million in 2013, and that's projected to rise to £1.7 billion in 2014. Yeah. Hi, Mackenzie. Uh, uh, it's fascinating to hear those figures, but can you express those same figures in terms of percentage profit? Well, what you've seen Patrick from uh, the European airlines is, is very clearly a large percentage increase, 240 million, 300 million, 1.67, uh, 1,670 million uh, up to 2014. So it's a dramatic increase. This remains very clearly an expanding and a highly profitable industry which enjoys massive tax breaks. That's my starting point, uh, and I find it hard uh, to take a, a different view. What should a fair contribution through taxation be from this industry? Well, for me, it has to be related to the social and environmental impacts of the industry on noise and traffic impacts uh, on the ground, as well, clearly, as the CO2 uh, impacts, which, uh, of course, are higher uh, given those emissions at altitude. Now, ABTA, uh, in its briefing to members, uh, 
accepts that aviation should pay its proper environmental cost, but quite laughably goes on to say, but believes that cost is more than reflected in the current APD levels. This is particularly true with the introduction of the emission trading scheme. The emission trading scheme, which, remember, only covers 25%, only 25% of aviation emissions uh, in Europe are covered in that scheme. This is an industry which makes a far lower contribution through tax than other transport modes, has a far higher impact uh, on climate change through its emissions. And uh, as for Keith Brown's argument uh, regarding short-haul uh, flights uh, being more environmentally uh, damaging, that's exactly the same spurious rationale that was put forward for the Air Route Development Fund, which saw continual increases in long-haul as well as short-haul flights. As you draw to a close, please. Uh, in, in closing, Deputy uh, Presiding indeed. Officer, the assumption underlying the industry's argument and the government's position is that aviation can just keep growing, while the rest of society uh, aims for dramatic CO2 cuts. I don't think the industry can be given a free ride for much longer, and I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate, and I call on Mike McKenzie to be followed by Graham Day, up to seven minutes. President officer, the issue of air passenger duty illustrates much that is wrong with Westminster government. Not just this Westminster government, but the institution itself. There is a good Scots word to describe it. That word is thrown. The case for reducing or abolishing air passenger duty has long since been made. It's a proverbial no-brainer. Not my words, the words of Mike Cantley from Visit Scotland. For there is no case at all to be made for a tax that acts against the public interest and at the same time deprives the Exchequer of revenue. And it's long been shown that reducing APD will more than pay for itself. It will pay for itself and increase tourism and associated visitor spend. It will pay for itself and increased VAT and an increased take from the whole basket of taxes. And it will pay for itself in job creation and in decreasing welfare costs. And as if that's not enough, it will pay for itself in increasing our competitiveness and the increasing business that will flow from this. It will pay for itself in increasing our global connectedness and the increased trade associated with this. Because Scotland, unlike the rest of the UK, is increasingly an exporting economy. We export our oil and gas. We also export our oil and gas expertise. And in fact, our oil and gas supply chain now earns more money internationally than it does in the North Sea. Would the member give way? Certainly. The, the member is, the member is uh, making a case that this would have a beneficial impact on the rest of the economy through all the oil men flying all over the world. That would be great. But it clearly has a cost to the Scottish budget. Can't he understand that reducing a tax means that you have to find that money from somewhere else in the Scottish Government's budget, even if he says there's a, a benefit in the wider economy? Mackenzie? I'm surprised that uh, Mr Harvey doesn't properly understand the nature of taxation, where sometimes you give away with one hand to collect much more in the other hand from the whole basket of taxes, virtually every single tax in the basket will, will deliver an increased take. <laughs> and if, if I can continue, Mr Harvey, we also export our food and drink. Exports in this sector have increased by 55% since 2007. They're now worth 5.4 billion, with a target of achieving over 7 billion by 2016. So in doing so, in pursuing this exporting success, we contribute greatly to the UK balance of trade, something, of course, that the UK government doesn't like to talk about, because without Scotland's exports, the UK will face real balance of trade difficulties. Without Scotland's exports, the UK trade deficit would double and that, of course, is one reason why, despite their current posturing, UK politicians will be pleased to enter into a currency union with Scotland after independence. Yeah. President officer, 
Participating successfully in the global economy, as Scotland does, requires travel. And in the mod modern world, this implies air travel. There is quite simply no other way to do it. Tourism brings in over four billion a year to the Scottish economy, and a significant proportion of this is via air, tra air travel. It therefore makes no sense to throttle our trade with the rest of the world. It makes no sense to stifle our tourism potential. It makes no sense at all to limit our economic potential by imposing air passenger duty. And that is no doubt why the Kalman Commission recommended APD to be devolved to Scotland. And that is why the Tories Strathclyde Commission, as I understand it, recommended that APD would be devolved. That is why the Lib Liberal Democrats' Home Rule Report, Federalism for the, the Best Future for Scotland, back in October last year, recommended the devolution of APD. But as usual, the UK government is too slow, is too dull and too deaf to listen to the compelling case which has been repeatedly made to devolve this tax. That is why, with independence, we intend to immediately reduce, certainly, yes. Tom Brown said abolishing the tax is a no-brainer. He said we'd make up every penny and more in other taxes. So why does he not favour immediate abolition upon independence? Mike Mike Brown, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that you asked that question because, of course, you don't just pull on that lever um, and suddenly get the windfall of taxes the same day. It takes time. It takes time. And that's why, sensibly, sensibly, the Scottish Government has pledged to reduce the tax to 50 per cent on independence and thereafter, as those taxation from other parts of the basket of taxes roll in, pour into Scotland, then at that point, ultimately, we will abolish the tax completely. I'm sure, Mr Brown, that you agree with me that that makes good economic sense. Your last minute. And, and of course, it's for those reasons, presiding officer, that the aviation industry and all who depend on it, and increasingly people across Scotland, are indicating their support for independence. Many thanks. And now call on Graham Day to be followed by Claudia Beanamish. Thank you, presiding officer. It, it's been guesstimated that by 2016, if nothing's done to tackle APD, this damaging measure will have cost the Scottish tourism and our economy some £210 million per annum over a four-year period by virtue of lost inbound tourist spend. But we actually don't have to look far to, to seek tangible evidence of how reducing this type of taxation can impact positively. In Ireland, they've just scrapped their equivalent of APD and are anticipating one million more visitors coming there annually as a result. On the back of this move, Ryanair have opened up 20 21 new routes in and out of Dublin, Shannon and Knock, which of course is advantageous not only for visitors, but affords the Irish greater scope for travelling themselves, not to mention potentially opening up new business opportunities. And there's the rub for Scotland. We're not competing on a level playing field or even one remotely resembling that with one of our closest tourism rivals, rivals who we are going head to head with in the areas of both golf and heritage tourism, particularly in the US market. Because of course, independent Ireland already had an advantage over us, having as 25 other European nations have reduced their VAT rate on tourism a little over two and a half years ago. And this latest move makes it even harder for our industry to take them on. Right now, we're trying to participate in a competitive marketplace with one hand tied behind our backs. The UK government, despite the Scottish government's imploring, has steadfastly refused to look at the VAT issue. And as with APD, such a decision can, of course, only be taken by them. The Irish Tourist Board commissioned a report into the impact of the first two years of a VAT reduction from 13.5 to 9 per cent. And I mention this partly to answer Patrick Harvey's point about budgetary impact. That report showed tourist numbers were up 10,000 jobs, uh, jobs being created across the industry as a result of the measure, and the income to the Treasury surrendered by the cut had been more than made up for by the tax take from those in employment and economic spend on the part of tourists. The figures actually, can I, can I just develop this point? There were 95 million euros in total coming from additional income tax and social welfare savings and tourism spend set against 88 million euros of a drop in VAT receipts. It proved a winning move. So too will be the abolition of their APD, even though it was pitched at a far lower level than that in the UK. 
As any of us who, uh, who fly know, the cost of taking to the skies to and from the UK is grossly inflated by APD. The hit's bad enough on short-haul flights. For long hauls, it really is punitive. Um, and, presiding officer, although the Westminster government does plan to tinker with us in 2015 by pegging the charge for all flights exceeding 2,000 miles at £284 for a family of four, the negative impact of the continuing levying of APD at such levels on the Scottish economy and our airports could actually go beyond the obvious. It is much cheaper, even factoring the, uh, the cost of a, con a connecting return flight uh, over the Irish uh, Sea now to fly to some destinations already served by Edinburgh from Dublin than it is from Scotland's capital. Can I just give three examples involving three different carriers flying to Philadelphia, New York and Paris in July of this year? In the case of Philadelphia, there is a £184 per, per flight saving to be made. In the case of New York, £404 per flight. And in the case of Paris, it is £30 per flight. And remember, Edinburgh is actually closer to Paris than Dublin. Unless this issue is tackled, either through APD being involved or control of it secured through independence, the more desirable option by far, then we could be facing a bleak time of it, with Scottish holidaymakers snubbing direct flights from this country in favour of cheaper alternatives to be had elsewhere. I don't want Scotland to be operating as some sort of regional hub linking people into London or Dublin. I want to see Scotland developing more comparably affordable direct flights and properly exploiting its potential as a first choice tourism destination. Uh, Ryanair's Michael O'Leary has predicted that full abolition of APD would see visitor numbers to Scotland double over five to ten years. Now, except we're not talking about full abolition, but a 50 per cent reduction moving towards removal of the tax when the public finances allow would certainly see much of that potential materialise. The, the Westminster government might be planning on abolishing two bands of APD for journeys in excess of. James Kelly. I thank the member for taking the, the intervention. Just on his proposal for the partial abolition of APD, that would take £135 million out of the Scottish budget. Can he tell us what areas of the budget he would cut to replace the shortfall? Thank you for taking that up. Labour's amendment claims a 50 per cent cut in APD would remove £135 million from an independent Scottish Government's budget. But what about the positive countering impact such a move would have? The PricewaterhouseCoopers report, I believe, last year suggested that if APD were abolished across the UK as a whole, it would generate the equivalent of 0.46 per cent of UK GDP in a year, rising to £16 billion plus within three years, leading to the creation of 60,000 jobs. Now, I'm no economist, but I think that suggests tackling APD would be a pretty good thing, especially if it were uh, married to looking at the VAT in the, tour the tourism sector as well. And who knows, we might just start to see people from the north of England travelling to an independent Scotland to catch flights from here, rather than the present situation, which is quite the reverse. If an independent uh, Scotland were to be reducing and ultimately scrapping APD as the UK remained on the path they presently are, the boost to our airline sector and our economy could be significant. Scots-based travellers would surely support our own airports instead of heading south in pursuit of a saving, and perhaps some travellers from over the border might be tempted north by cheaper fares. The fact is we need action on this issue, and, presiding officer, that action needs to go beyond simply developing, uh, devolving APD. Scotland needs control of this measure, as it does every other power associated with a fully independent country. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Claudia Beamish to be followed by Colin Keir. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we have heard from the Minister and also from Mike McKenzie and Graham Day about the economic factors behind um, air passenger duty. I would like to take this opportunity to concentrate on the environmental impact and aspects in this debate, uh, as well as the role of air travel in um, general transport connectivity. My Labour colleague Mark Griffin has already argued the benefits of um, that the, the benefits of devolving air passenger duty at this stage still need to be assessed. And I don't intend to go into those arguments again. Uh, the SNP plans to abolish the duty, and I quote, um, as I understand it, when fa public finances allow, whenever this may be. Frankly, this does seem somewhat simplistic and rather disingenuous. Far, for, far from detailed research on the economic and environmental consequences, um, being carried out. We, are, um, we, we don't have any information on this, and I think we need this to understand the full picture of what the Scottish Government is saying, both in terms of the 50% and, and later on. Um, as I've already highlighted uh, in many debates, and other members across this chamber have, in 2009 this chamber voted to pass the Climate Change Act, committing us to reducing carbon emissions by 46% by 2020. 
2022 and I think it's 2020 actually, and 40%, 80% by 2050. As the Scottish Government has been made all too aware, um, as my colleague Mark Griffin highlighted as well, um, by stakeholders outside this Parliament, this is no easy task. And we acknowledge that across the Chamber in all parties. Our targets are the most ambitious in the world and difficult to achieve. But the long-term benefits of cutting greenhouse gas emissions were recognised by all parties and led this government and those that, f those that will follow in the future to commit to taking the issue of climate change very seriously and develop developing policies. Now I won't take an intervention. I'm just developing what I want to say. Sorry. Um, and developing policies accordingly. It is the pathways that matter, matter, and these are complex and difficult for us all. As such, I'm struggling to understand how cutting APD, which encourages more air travel, is comparable with reducing greenhouse gas, gas emissions. I'm sure the Minister does not need me to point out that air travel produces one of the highest levels of emissions of any global sector. So why is it the Scottish Government is aiming to, to cut this tax? And in... Yeah. Minister yes. Keith Brown. The member has concentrated on environmental issues, and I think she would acknowledge we have seen a 12% reduction in terms of uh, transport emissions in Scotland since uh, 2007. But in addition to that, she's aware that we intend to spend £1.3 billion on environmental measures 2013-16. to 16. Can I just ask, is it her position the Labour Party, on principle, does not support the devolution of APD to Scotland? Because that's not clear so far from what's been said. Right, that, that's a number of questions that the Minister has asked. Um, one question. We're, we're looking at that possibility, and my colleague Mark Griffin has already highlighted that there are both economic and environmental issues that need to be assessed before we make, take that final decision, and I thought that was um, already clear. Um, in making the decision that the Scottish Government has made, has the Scottish Government assessed what the likely increase in air travel might be due to a cut, and further, has the Scottish Government considered the increase in carbon uh, which would be created and how this would be offset in relation to, um, to our carbon emissions. The tax breaks to aviation industry are major, as Patrick Harvey has already highlighted. Um, but in, in terms of low carbon, the, the SNP's own white paper announced the in intention, and I quote, to align transport policy with energy policy to achieve Scotland's ambitious decarbonisation targets. A commendable, a commendable goal to be sure. However, it surely sits uncomfortably with the status aim to bring much of the economic support to a potential independent Scotland from oil revenues and uh, as part of the fossil fuel mix and indeed um, uh, the, the cut in aviation uh, tax. In this case, we should sure... I won't take an intervention, I'm just going on to a new point. Uh, in this case, we should surely be encouraging people to fly less wherever possible, I stress, not creating another needless incentive to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. I'm afraid to say that this is somewhat hypocritical in my view and has been a running pattern of this government, forever making grand pronouncements on environmental issues, then at the same time pursuing policies which contradict their previous intentions, be it with North Sea oil and energy or in the marine environment. The Scottish Government's policy on sustainable economic growth, in my view, is in danger of losing that word in the middle, sustainable. In any case, the debate today on air passenger duty uh, only is in itself somewhat of a red herring. The issue of transport connectivity should be viewed as a whole, rather than concentrating on one aspect of the transport sector in isolation in this debate. We heard in the chamber last week about the new Caledonian sleeper franchise and how this will greatly improve rail connections to London. There are also opportunities to further develop rail travel to mainline Europe to consider. Of course, no one is saying that all air travel should be discouraged. Most non-domestic journeys require air travel, especially intercontinental ones. However, there is a proliferation of intercity flights within the UK, which I believe could be um, countered by arguments for more train travel, um, although, of course, nobody's acknowledged yet, I don't think, the importance of the exemption from the APD for the Western Isles, where this would, it would not be possible to um, make this journey in a realistic way otherwise. Members will agree it is, it is fair and sensible to go forward looking at um, this in the round, I hope, in terms of connectivity. Uh, it can sometimes take just as long to get to some of our major cities from Edinburgh by, uh, by flying as it, as it does by going by rail. 
And one of the main reasons for the choice of flight is sometimes the cost, having Googled a lot of train costs um, and found that those aren't necessarily affordable for people either. Thinking laterally also, is the Scottish Government working with Visit Scotland to encourage families to consider holidaying in Scotland and not having to um, fly abroad, although I put my hand up and say occasionally I do that as well. But, you know, we, we do need to look at these issues in the round and not just look at the air passenger duty today. So the SNP's bold assertion that they will abolish um, APD when the public finances allow, I ask the question of the Minister, has this been properly weighed up in relation to economic and environmental impact? Draw to or is it yet please? another example of the politics where we can offer, uh, where the SNP can offer something for um, beyond independence um, to hold out in front of people and in front of businesses and not have it properly costed and we'll never know if it would happen or not. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now call on Colin Keir to be followed by Chick Brody. Up to seven minutes, please. Can I thank you, Presiding Officer, uh, for calling me today. There's few things that bind those within and, out, within and outside the aviation industry more than their hatred of APD. Fair tax and flying is an alliance of over 30 airlines, airports, tour operators, destination and travel trade associations, who are all calling on the government, the UK government, to make UK aviation tax fairer. When you add to those people such as uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, certainly here in Edinburgh, who are of the same mind, there is a very, very broad opinion that there is something wrong with this tax. Introduced in 1994, I believe it was brought in on the back of it's an environmental tax. It's certainly not that now. It's just a tax. Nobody even claims it to be anything close to an environmental tax. It started off, of course, at just £5 for short journeys and £10 elsewhere. And now, of course, we have rates, which the World Economic Forum reported last year, stated that the UK has the world's highest rate of APD. We've seen over the past couple of years the PwC uh, reports. Incidentally, a report written by people who used to work in the uh, UK Treasury and, of course, the uh, York Aviation report that was commissioned by the uh, Scottish airports. I think in terms of the Scottish airports, as Mr Johnson pointed out, we've had some pretty good figures. These have been in spite of air passenger duty. It's been a demand for more direct flights and it's investment due to the hard work of those people who run the airports and are looking for route development. The one thing that we have uh, had here is success that way. We could make it better and I believe Edinburgh particularly as uh, the local MSP, which has the airport in the constituency, is a driver for the economy. Everyone in the business sector accepts that. And it is there, it needs to be encouraged. We need jobs and we need to get the economy moving. And it is starting through the avi aviation industry. So, given what we've heard so far from a number of people in Weber, we can see the difficulties in economic terms that those in the avi aviation industry are faced with, and I've explained in terms of Edinburgh Airport. And indeed, as pointed out by the Minister, there's been a comment from uh, the Chief Executive of Flybe, Syed Hamad, who said, and I'll quote him here, across the aviation in industry, scrapping air passenger duty would not only incentivise airlines to provide new routes and enhance travel for Scotland's passengers, it would also significantly boost business and the economy. Scottish business people and consumers have to count the cost of paying this tax twice when travelling domestically to an English airport a disproportionate financial penalty which must not be allowed to continue. Now, this is not necessarily just us. I mean, I'm sure the airport, in fact, I know the Airport Operators Association that works at UK, and particularly those in the north of England, such as Newcastle and Manchester, are all saying the same thing. And that's what makes it even more worrying. I am sure that the comments made by some members of the Labour Party there today will be sending shivers down the back of this industry because they are looking for support. It's a simple fact of it, and it is shown by the comments of many people. So Scottish business people and consumers generally have had to count the cost of paying this tax twice, as we said. 
And this is really the crux of the problem. We have a geographical problem and a hub problem that means we end up paying uh, twice. And it's nothing more than Westminster's demand for a tax. As I say, it's not a green tax. And it's a constant source of amazement that the Chancellor has so far failed to respond to the pleas of business leaders such as Richard Branson of Virgin Atlantic, Willie Walsh of BA, Carolyn McCall of EasyJet, and of course Saad Hamid uh, of Flybe, as well as Michael O'Leary, to stop trying to make their businesses as uncompetitive uh, as they are in an incredibly difficult market, and uncompetitive it is. In the case of the UK, the competition isn't just between carriers and airports, it's between nations. And the last time I looked, I think it was mentioned by the Minister, APD was paid by a family of four on a holiday to Florida. That is £276 against £154 for the equivalent family in Germany going to the same destination. Then, of course, there's the Republic of Ireland, as uh, Graham Days pointed out, which scrapped the tax. And indeed, unlike uh, Scotland, where we were promised through Calman that this would be devolved, of course, it got devolved to Northern Ireland in an attempt to be more competitive with Dublin. Of course, what's the difference between Belfast and Dublin to Belfast and Glasgow? We're talking airplanes here. I believe this has put Scotland at a competitive disadvantage anyway. But Westminster demands to hold on. The Labour Party appears to have... We, we seem to think that they'd seen a bit of merit in devolving powers. Now we're not terribly happy. Oh, OK, Mr Brown. Gavin Brown. I'm great. We're just thinking through his example there. How does making it cheaper for families go to Florida help the Scottish economy? Thank you. Well, I would have thought that the complete infrastructure of uh, uh, business in terms of travel, ticketing... Uh, the services provided, the amount of uh, money you may well spend with your family as you're waiting on a flight, and all the basic stuff like that has got to show that that's business. People are making money out of this, and the taxation that comes from that is such. Now, I have to say the Tories now appear to be mildly supportive of uh, APD, but as, the minister is, uh, but as the Minister's pointed out, um, the original Guardian online uh, article seemed to suggest that uh, uh, the leadership in London and the Treasury are just completely against it. So I'm sorry if uh, I take what's been said in your launch the other day there as uh, with a pinch of salt. What's certainly true is I certainly don't believe there'll be much in the way of expectation that any one of the better together parties uh, will actually provide relief for travellers in the event of a no vote. APD just doesn't work. It hurts the travelling public. It hurts businesses and it hurts Scotland more than any other part of the UK. And ordinary people who have to save for months, uh, unlike some who have uh, a lot please. of money, they have to save for months to take their family on the holiday that they want to take, are penalised because of this tax. Why on earth should we be taxed for this? You know, just to travel through London we end up paying double the cost. And AP's, APD is also a barrier when it comes to airports vying for new routes. If Could you draw to a close, please? I'll finish off very briefly saying it's not just ourselves, but actually the southeast of England is paying the penalty for it. Uh, it will do through the amount of direct flights won by those here in Scotland. And the sooner we get the power to have APD under our full control and a full independent nation, the sooner the better. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Chuck Brodie to be followed by Dr. Elaine Murray. Up Thank you, Presiding minutes, Officer. Please. <coughs> Presiding Officer, of any one matter, any one tax illustrates and confirms the Westminster Coalition inhabits and its predecessor inhabited the e economic madhouse, then APD is it. In 1993, when the then Tory Chancellor, uh, Ken Clark, said, a quote, I need to raise revenue, but to do so in a way which does least damage, does least damage to the economy. He went on, I propose to levy a small, a small a duty on all our passengers from UK airports set at £5 for departures to anywhere in the United Kingdom and £10 for departures elsewhere. Now, of course, it's £340 for a family of four to visit Australia. He went on, there would be exemption for transfer passengers and most flights between the Scottish Islands, uh, and they, they would not bear the tax. Now, when first announced, the Tory government argued that the new duty was most unlikely, most unlikely to have a big impact on the sales of flights. 
And in a written answer at the time, the then Paymaster General, and he was a general, Sir John Cope stated that, I quote, the overall, the tax is expected to reduce demand for air travel by around 2.5%. It brings to mind Burns. It's, hey, Johnny Cope, are you walking yet? Or are you sleeping? I would wait. One thing is for sure. We've been sleepwalking into an unmitigated disaster for an important element of our economy, our jobs, our tourism, and our vibrant air industries, as this tax has grown and, has, and grew over the last 20 years of Westminster in management. Never mind the Tobin tax on financial tax, uh, transactions, here we have the Topsy tax. Calman Commission was right that we should have had a, a, a power over APD and the UK government is and was wrong. And it's not just Scotland, of course. I'm. Alex Johnston. Coleman Commission today. Could you just remind me the extent of the SNP's engagement with that commission? Check, Rodi. <laughs> well, on the basis, I mean, one, one thing that uh, uh, Aristophanes said, and I say this to Mr Johnson with all goodwill, man may learn wisdom even from a foe. The rationale behind that was that Scotland had made quite clear it was looking for full independence and not a halfway house. So, and it's not just Scotland that affects, but the UK exchequer. And, and Patrick Harvey was, uh, is right to make the point about uh, the, the effect on uh, climate change aspirations, because none of the conversations have meaningfully, at least emanated from the, the Chancellor Exchequer or, or the Treasury body, uh, considering fuel efficiency or indeed the need to uh, uh, move to modern aircraft. And the same application of duty applies to very old aircraft. So a clear lack of long-term strategy that will, I believe, see Heathrow almost paralysed. Uh, Gatwick and uh, uh, Stansted also just so at peak times, while airports and mitigation elsewhere can, were and would fight uh, for and seek international uh, direct routes. Much better that than lose, and I say this uh, meaningfully, better that than lose London as a significant international hub. But of course, the law of diminishing returns has never been a shining feature of the UK Treasury economic management. Presiding officer, no one, no one diminishes the tax, uh, the taxing time for our airports. Uh, and I specifically welcome the decision recently on Presswick, but I want to see all of Scotland's airports flourish as they can under the professional management that manages them. And, in, and, and see it flourish in what I believe will be a growing economy. Passenger departure tax, taxes like APD erode the economy, certainly the profitability of the, of the airlines and, the, and consequently the jobs in these airlines and at airports, and not to mention the enjoyment of customers, Mr Brown, that like to go to Florida. This is the case across Europe, but the Netherlands, Denmark and now Ireland have abolished a, a, such a tax. And for example, in the Netherlands, the point I was trying to make to Mr Griffin, I think there might be some confusion when I uh, answered Patrick Harvey, I, the point I was trying to raise with Mr Griffin, and as I raised with Mr Harvey, is that the Netherlands canned the tax after one year because the 250 million euros that it was bringing into their economy was losing them, on the other hand, 700 million euros in tourism and VAT income. And of course, their tourism, their tourism prospers uh, yet again. And, presiding officer, while some Europeans still levy air duty, none has seen the increase of the 165% since 2007 in air passenger duty, which we have seen and felt in the UK. And nowhere, eh, presiding officer, does that resonate more than its impact, of course, on Scotland. I know the opposition parties will rail this because many have developed a unique skill in uh, proposing nothing and opposing everything. But if they want a perfect illustration of why Scotland's economy could benefit from independence, then APD is the perfect canvas. Scotland's major airports management and the associated airline, associated airline management are unanimous. They are professional managers involved in the industries. They're the professionals who know, agree we should set off on a journey to reduce and then eliminate this topsy tax. What we have to do to improve our exports in knowledge transfer, in trade, 
in competitiveness and in tourism, which is an export activity, if we are to ride the punches of global competition, we need more direct and international connectivity, which is vital for business and, by the way, indirectly helps the rest of the UK economy, as London and the South East could choke currently if we don't do something on limited air transport capacity. I'm in my last minute, I'm sorry. I will not, presiding officer, with uh, your, agreement dwell, with your agreement dwell on the likely neg negative impact on Scottish expenditure and jobs if Boris's fantasy becomes reality. It really is fantasy island. In this significant area of international tourism and business, as in many other areas, Scotland is increasingly divergent from London and the rest of the UK. Economically, with jobs at its heart, we need to be able to do to at least to at least develop a competitive advantage where we can. We'd rather do that than whinge about it. And the independent ability to reduce and then eliminate this iniquitous tax would allow us to share the investment and the motivation to achieve the jobs which I know we all want. I'm afraid you must close I'm just now. finishing, presiding officer. That will only come about, I believe, with the sovereignty of independence. It will then be up to others outside to meet that economic challenge that we would introduce, which I submit and suspect would be in their economic interests also. Thank you very much. I believe members were advised they could have up to seven minutes for their speeches, and that's all that is available for members. Elaine Murray, to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, listening to this debate, I'm not actually sure that the Scottish Government's arguments have really progressed much beyond the debate back in November 2012. I do wonder if there's a wee bit of a motivation perhaps to try and embarrass members of other parties and possibly even people like myself who actually admitted at that time that there was a case uh, for the devolution uh, of APD. Um, and I'm certainly not going, going to deny what I said at that time. But I think there are issues which need to be counterbalanced with that. And if I can illustrate some of those problems, perhaps with the, the, the difficulty there could be about having two different regimes in the United Kingdom by a, a, a local example, because for my constituents, uh, it, no, I'd, I would actually like to illustrate it with my local example. I'm sure you may have a local example if you're speaking that you wish to, to use. Uh, my constituents uh, in the north of England uh, sorry, my, my, for my constituency airports in the north of England are as accessible as those in the central belt of Scotland and are probably actually more widely used. In fact, passengers can take a train directly into Manchester Airport from Lockerbie or from Dumfries and Annan and Gretna by changing at Carlisle. And in fact, there's been a long cherished wish in the Solway Basin to have Carlisle open, Airport open to passenger flights. And this aspiration, unfortunately, has been uh, disappointed in March this year when an application for the development of Carlisle Airport was overturned in the High Court after a challenge from a local farmer. But nevertheless, the Stobart Group still hope to bring forward another application, which they hope would result in daily passenger fly flights to Dublin and to London. And obviously, if that aspiration is realised, uh, and I accept it has been discussed for many years without much in the way of s significant progress. But if it is actually eventually realised, it could really open up additional tourism potential for Dumfries and Galloway. And if it's unfair that passengers to and from Scottish airports may have to pay air passenger duty twice if there is no direct flight from that airport, and I made that point in the debate in back in uh, November 2012. Equally, it is unfair that passengers travelling to and from airports in the northern parts of England, which could include some of my constituents who are crossing the border do it indeed. You can have the opposite situation where people are travelling from the north of England into Scottish airports. Why should any of us have to pay twice because there is no direct flight from our, our own airport? Uh, indeed, they are, the airports in the north of England and their passengers could be disadvantaged if, with respect not just to London, but to Scotland and Wales too, uh, under the uh, devolution of APD. So it is a complex situation. Our amendment back then in November 2012 urged the Scottish to the UK government to take action to resolve that anomaly because it is disadvantaging passengers from airports in Scotland, Wales and the north of England. Now, I'm not quite sure with some of the reforms which are proposed by the UK government whether that is being addressed and perhaps the Conservative speaker could actually uh, 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 enlighten us on whether there are any intentions to, to actually resolve that anom anomaly. 
But devolving APD at this particular stage could result in tax competition, as we've heard from Mark Griffin and others, rather than resolving the wider issues around the way in which a tax operates. And you know, the great thing about devolution is that it can be reviewed and refined in the light of experience. And indeed, that is happening. Unfortunately, if you take the decision of independence, there's no way back if you don't happen to like it. When this tax was introduced in 1994, climate change was far further down the agenda in terms of priority. But as Claudia Beamish pointed out, the Scottish Parliament passed the Climate Change Act in 2009, committing ourselves to a 42% reduction in emissions only six years from now, in 2020, and 80% by 2050. And very importantly, actually, that, that bill included our share of emissions from international aviation and from shipping. That was actually quite a bold thing to do. And it's a thing I think that we recognise as part of the groundbreaking re legislation which we passed. And at the same time, the Scottish Government has missed its annual reduction targets now for two years in succession. So we have got a problem. We set ourselves targets and we didn't reach them. I don't know that APD as it stands is the best way of controlling aircraft emissions. But I do not endorse any approach which is simply about reducing tax and eventually removing APD altogether without replacing it with some other form of taxation on aviation emissions. Perhaps taxing passengers is not the best way. Perhaps there are some ways in which taxation could be aimed at those companies which use aircraft or fuels which are more polluting. There might be ways in which we could refine it, but I do not think it is correct to take the tax away altogether. In fact, I recall from that debate uh, to which I refer that Stuart Stevenson had some quite interesting uh, examples of possible ways of tackling the, uh, the, actual, the, the aviation fuel uh, emissions in terms of types of fuel and so on. So I think there needs to be consideration of how APD could be reformed, and that is what Labour colleagues in Westminster have been urging the UK government to do. Now, the Scottish Government says it would reduce APD by 50% in the first term of the next Parliament. I'm slightly puzzled as to why they only want APD to be devolved if there is a yes vote in September, whether previously I thought they wanted APD to be devolved full stop. Well, that's what the, that's what the uh, motion says. That aside, however, the Government's proposal to cut APD by 50% would remove, as we've heard, £135 million from the Scottish budget without any indication where the money would be coming from. Now, I expect that like the 385 million proposed cut to corporation tax, their answer will be, in fact, I already heard, economic growth. But there is still a problem. And I think actually Gavin Brown got, uh, I can't remember which uh, member of the SNP speakers, but he got one of them to actually admit the problem. Because even if there is an economic growth in the unlikely event that the Scottish Government's highly optimistic assertions actually were correct, it's not going to happen instantaneously, but the cuts to the budget will bite as soon as they are implemented. So at the start, £135 million would be removed from the budget in order to make it cheaper for Scottish residents to fly off on holiday. Now, we all like a cheap holiday. I do as much as anybody else. But that, so that would be popular. But is that really the best use of £135 million? If there's £135 million just kicking around with nothing to be done with it, might it not be better to use it to invest in our public transport system, which gets people to and from work every day and contributes to economic growth? Or, or perhaps to reinstate some of the rail projects which the Scottish Government has either abandoned or delayed? Those would also contribute to economic growth and they would contribute to economic growth in a sustainable manner. Please draw to a conclusion. Right. Unfortunately, the Scottish Government, having included aviation emissions in the Climate Change Act, seems now to be re retreating rather fast from action to tackle aviation emissions. APD may not be the best way, but would the Scottish Government bring in an alternative green tax? If they get rid of APD, are they going to bring in an alternative green tax to tackle the issue of aviation emissions? Many thanks. Kevin Stewart to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, uh, President Officer. And I find this debate somewhat bizarre because it seemed that not so long ago, folk from across this chamber were supportive of the devolution of air passenger, passenger duty. In fact, um, about 18 months ago, uh, I attended an event that was hosted by Tory MSP Jamie McGregor, where uh, there was a cross-party uh, support there for the tourism industry who wanted to see the demise of air passenger duty. And we heard from these people that some folks were no longer coming to Scotland uh, for, for trips because of that APD. Um, we heard from the Calman Commission that APD should be devolved. The Strathclyde Commission 
said the APD should be devolved. The Campbell Commission from the Lib Dems said APD should be devolved. And the Labour interim report on devolution said that there is a case for D uh, APD to be devolved. And yet today, uh, we are hearing from all fronts that they no longer believe that that is the case. Now, I would say to the people out there that you should be extremely sceptical of what these unionist parties are saying on any given thing because they are inevitably going to turn that around and say, no, we don't believe that that should be the case. Be very, very sceptical indeed. Dr Murray has just talked about uh, the situation where she doesn't want to see two different regimes in the United Kingdom. Well, the reality is that we already have two different regimes because Northern Ireland has had APD devolved. What is the difference between the North of Ireland and Scotland in that regard is what I would ask. Now, let's get back to uh, what people out there are actually thinking. Because I represent the northeast of Scotland and I get lots and lots of moans and groans uh, about the fact that there are not enough routes from the northeast of Scotland and the costs of flying from the northeast of Scotland uh, to other parts of the world. And Nick Barton, who was the interim managing director of Aberdeen International Airport for a while, had said that numerous studies have spelled out the impact that it, that it is having, and we have even seen air, rival airline bosses standing shoulder to shoulder, united against APD. At the same time, we're working within an industry which, it, by its very nature, is exceptionally mobile, and airlines looking to serve new markets will ultimately choose other European countries at the expense of Scotland. And we have seen that happen. Uh, yes, I'll give way to Mr Johnson. Is Alec this Johnson. not a classic example of how the SNP would rather stand isolated and impotent than work together across this parliament to achieve our long-term objective? Kevin Stewart. This is not about isolation at all. This is about creating new international routes so that we can connect with our partners right across the globe. The isolationism here comes from those folks uh, who feel uh, that we have no option uh, but to keep APD powers at Westminster. That is what is creating isolationism. Absolutely. I want to see internationalism. Let's move on to the current managing director of Aberdeen Airport, Carol Benzie, who said, what is becoming increasingly clear are the implications of this tax on UK businesses. Put simply, APD adds to the burden of running a successful company. 65% of our passengers in Aberdeen are travelling in a professional capacity and ultimately the responsibility for paying APD in each and every one of these cases is being passed back to their employer. Firms in Aberdeen are connected globally with links in emerging and, and existing markets. These businesses are paying APD twice if they choose to use a hub airport in the UK and are taking their business elsewhere in increasing numbers to avoid this tax. Ultimately, APD, which we are told is helping get it back to growth, is actually doing more harm than good. Now, I really do think that we should be uh, listening uh, to uh, these folks who are involved on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in this business. And beyond that, listening to the folks that I do regularly who are travelling from Aberdeen to all parts of the globe whose competitiveness uh, uh, is actually being damaged by this tax. And as Carol Benzie rightly says, uh, many folk are choosing to, to use hub airports elsewhere. They're travelling to Charles de Gaulle. They're travelling uh, to Schiphol and various other places. They will be travelling to Northern Ireland very soon, I'm sure, uh, now that they will uh, see APD um, going. And what I want to see is less of these short-haul flights uh, to hub airports uh, and much more direct routes from Scotland, from Aberdeen, from Glasgow, from Edinburgh, from Prestwick, uh, to all parts of the globe. 
That is much more environmentally friendly rather than having those short haul flights. Uh, I'll give way to Mr. Harvey. Patrick Harvey. Grateful. I'm just wondering if, if that's the consequence he anticipates flowing from this policy of halving and then scrapping air passenger duty. Why does the Scottish Government's own assessment of the carbon impact show that emissions would rise as a result of this policy? Kevin Stewart, during your last minute. I, I think we all know, uh, President Officer, that uh, short haul flights have the greatest impact uh, on the environment. Uh, and the York Aviation Report, which uh, you know, some folk have poo-pooed here today, um, and I think that that is a very wrong thing to do, so it says themselves that APD uh, is seen as a pseudo-environmental tax, despite the fact that rates take no account of the actual environmental impact of a flight, and f future plans have never sought to reflect aviation's entry into the EU ETS in 2012. The Don't new coalition question. government appears to view APD more simply as a revenue-raising instrument. I agree that that is what they are doing. I think that we should have these powers, and I think we could do much better with them. Thank you, President. Officer. Thank you very much. Stuart Stevenson, to be followed by Ian Gray. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, pre Presiding Officer. Uh, it was uh, November 2012 I last spoke on this subject, as many of the rest of us also, uh, also did. Um, I think there's been quite a lot of talking about it. I think well, perhaps time we should be thinking about what Benjamin Franklin once said. He said, well done is better than well said. Well, there's been an awful lot said. It's now time to move from talking about things to actually doing things. Now, the debate's been quite interesting, and I suspect I can make quite significant common cause uh, with Elaine Murray and perhaps uh, one or two others. Now, I'm going to try and talk about two things. First of all, the economics, and secondly, about the environmental opportunities that there might be from a different approach. Um, let me just run through, and I've done this in the back of an envelope, so I don't pretend this is the final word on the subject or anything like it. Um, an average vacationer coming on a short-haul vacation to Scotland will spend 3.6 nights in Scotland. If they're uh, spending, and this is the average spend, £120 on a hotel, uh, that is £72 in VAT. New tax from somebody who wouldn't be coming. They probably get the taxi from Edinburgh Airport into the centre of Edinburgh and the taxi back out to the airport because the kind of tourists, they might get the bus, they might get the tram. I'm in favour of trams, wrong route, but that's a different issue for another day. Uh, that's another um, £4 in fuel duty and VAT on the taxi journey. They'll have three restaurant meals, let's say at £25 uh, a time. That's a further £15 in tax. We're now up to £93 in tax. We haven't taken any account of the spending in our shops that they will undoubtedly undertake. When I do my little calculation, capable of criticism, but you can't argue with the principles, you're looking at a tax take for a new passenger of something of the order of 150 to 200 pounds for an average short haul visit. The APD is of course around the 20 pounds. Now of course, you take the 20 pounds off everybody who's already coming and you gain the new people. I don't think there's been enough economic analysis to look at that subject in the debate so far. And I think we should look at it further. I don't think we've reached the end of the story uh, on economics, but there is a clear indication that if you get new people here, you get new tax take. We have to make sure we get enough new people. To off I'm not going to, for time reasons, and because my argument, as I've said, is not complete and comprehensive. I'll let uh, the member deal with that in his uh, uh, closing remarks. I want to just address one or two things that have been said. Um, for example, Patrick Harvey says, uh, I, I think said, all airlines don't pay VAT. Not quite true. In Scotland, the routes from Oban to Col, Colonsay and Islay, and from Kirkwall to the outlying islands, and uh, from Tingwall to the islands in Shetland, they all pay VAT on their fuel because they burn Avgas rather than Avtour. 
I admit it's a small proportion of what goes on. It actually doesn't seem to make very much difference one way or the other, to be honest. And I think there is certainly a case for looking at the way in which we tax uh, airline operating companies. But of course, the essential thing is it's a regressive tax. We charge people this and deny ourselves more. Now, let's talk about environmental issues. Last time I, I talked about a few things. The point about having the powers over APD, that's fine. But what we actually need is the powers over the whole picture. And I was to say, is APD the answer? If it is, then it's a very silly question indeed. If we could use APD, and this would be a crude way of doing it for saying turboprop aircraft, you pay less APD per passenger. Because turboprop aircraft are less polluting for two reasons. You burn less fuel per mile. And you fly lower, so the radiative forcing effect is similarly reduced. If you're down at the bottom in an unpressurized aircraft, flying our little flights around Scotland, your radiative forcing is halved again, and your fuel cost is down to a third. If we adopted the Norwegian model, where many of your commuter flights are flown in aircraft like the Cessna Caravan, which is a single-engined turboprop aircraft, and by the way, single-engined light aircraft have a better safety record than multi-engined aircraft. Several, uh, the American uh, uh, Federal Aviation Authority has all the numbers on that. And almost uniquely, the UK won't allow that kind of operation for our scheduled services in instrument conditions. And it would have an environmental benefit as well as an economic benefit. And it would make some routes, say, for example, from Sky down uh, to Glasgow, economically more viable. APD is part of that, and we can do things with it. We could, as I said in my contribution in 2012, differential APD if you tow your aircraft out to adjacent to the runway. On average, that stops five tons of fuel burn in a 757. Five tons of fuel is burnt just to get from the stand out to where the takeoff point is. Tow them out and you save five pounds. Using APD to encourage people, uh, to airlines to do that because they need to invest in trucks to tow things out so we give them something on that basis. So it's not just about getting APD, it's about having all the policy levers that surround APD. And that is one of the huge difficulties in the way the devolution settlement has been constructed and operates. And I don't say anybody set out to do this deliberately. They didn't. They set out with a good and honest heart to construct a settlement, but it actually doesn't work. You piecemeal devolve little bits instead of devolving policy areas where you can take a proper, coordinated approach to all the issues in an area. So APD, yes, let's get that, because I think we could use it more imaginatively. We could use it for economic and environmental benefit. But if we've got all the powers that surround that, then we could do so much more. And it's in that spirit that I say, whatever the outcome in September, let's get it across here. Because if it's a yes vote, we're still under Westminster till 2016. There's time to start getting the benefits quickly, even in a yes vote. But a yes vote guarantees we'll have them sooner rather than later and forever. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. I call Ian Gray to be followed by George Adam. Presiding officer, most of this debate has been devoted to uh, colleagues uh, denouncing the evils of this particular tax. Indeed, Mr Johnson began by denouncing all taxes evil, and I'm happy to disagree with him. Uh, but I'm also happy to accept that this one, air passenger duty, is a mess. Uh, and uh, it, it does undoubtedly need to be reformed. I am, however, no longer convinced that simply devolving it is necessarily uh, the solution. Part of the problem, and Mr Johnson referred to this too, and others have as well, uh, is that it was introduced as an environmental levy, a green tax, but it's now clear, Mr Johnson said this, I think Mr Keir said this as well, and one or two others, it is now simply another tax providing revenue, and I think that is a, a fair assessment and one of the reasons that it does need to be reformed. After all, the impact on climate change of aviation is central to this, to this debate. Transport is the second largest source of carbon emissions and aviation is uh, the most polluting form of transport, as Mr Harvey uh, spoke about in some detail. And 
Uh, Mr Brown did try and make a fist of this argument that somehow reducing tax and making uh, uh, aircraft travel cheaper would be a green measure because there would be more direct flights, people wouldn't uh, go to Dublin or to Sheeple. I, I, I really don't think that is an argument which has a great deal of credibility. But there are real anomalies about the way this tax operates at the moment, and, and many have referred to them. Uh, for example, in the Highlands and Islands, the APD doesn't apply. It, it never has. That is an anomaly. We've seen changes in Northern Ireland and indeed the Republic of Ireland, which have now led to anomalies. But that actually argues against devolution of this taxation as a solution, because it is clear that what is going to happen with devolution all round of this tax is simply a race to the bottom on taxation, uh, which will uh, amount to the end of your passenger duty, but will leave us with no answer to the problem of how we try to tax uh, air travel uh, in order to compensate for the damage that they do uh, to the environment and to our climate. This is clearly a national, indeed an international problem, and we need to address solutions nationally and indeed internationally, not in smaller and smaller bits. So, Mike McKenzie, can I have Mike McKenzie's microphone, please? Mike McKenzie, I'm afraid there isn't any extra time. Could you be quick, please, Mr McKenzie? I acknowledge the great reduction in emissions from and, fuel, and the greater fuel efficiency in aviation over the last 30 years. Ian Gray. I certainly hope that's possible, but I hope the member will also acknowledge that the Scottish Government have repeatedly missed their own carbon emission targets, uh, and so uh, they have to address how they're going to reduce uh, the impact of aviation amongst everything else. Look, the one thing which we can be sure about uh, if we cut air passenger duty is the impact on the public finances, £135 million, which would have to be replaced in order to pay for public services. And this argument that that change is somehow uh, cost neutral or even will bring in more money makes no sense, because if it did, why does the White Paper say the second 50% can only be abolished when public finances allow? If there's no impact on public finances, you should get rid of it all at once. You don't believe that, and neither do we. And the truth is, no, I'm sorry, not after that. But the truth is, if what we are concerned about is more direct flights from Scotland, it would be an argument we could take more seriously if the Scottish Government had found a replacement for the most successful route development fund anywhere in these islands, which brought in 41 new direct flights and which they simply abolished. Flights like uh, for Mr Stewart's constituents from Aberdeen to Stavanger, flights to Stockholm, flights to Dubai, all delivered by RDF. Or if we were really concerned about business connectivity at our airports, uh, then we wouldn't have a government which had cancelled the Glasgow Airport rail link. And, then can and also cancelled the Edinburgh Airport rail, rail link. Now, say to Mr Keir, um, that Edinburgh Airport rail link could have, made, could have made the airport that he quite properly supports in his constituency one of the best connected airports anywhere in the world. Indeed, Elaine Murray's constituents might have been able to get a train to an airport in Edinburgh instead of going to Manchester or to Newcastle, as they have to at the moment. But the truth is, of course, that all of this is really just another proxy for the independence debate. As with childcare, as with pensions, as with carers we've seen this week, all of this is just another reason to claim that after a yes vote, everything would be more and cheaper, that Scotland wouldn't have to face difficult decisions or the great challenges of our age, be that demographic change uh, or the change in climate. None of that is credible. And I know throughout the debate, uh, many have quoted support from industry. But for industry, of course, the aviation industry, uh, independence is just a proxy for the APD debate. Mm -hmm. Of course, they want to see a reduction in taxation in their industry. But uh, even Willie Walsh has said, made it quite clear that even were these changes to happen to APD, he would not plan to introduce more long-haul flights in Scotland. He's absolutely clear on that. And as for Mr O'Leary, well, I've met Mr O'Leary years ago when I was a minister. I got on perfectly well with him. 
um, which was difficult because he spent the whole meeting dressed as Bob the Builder, um, for a reason which escapes me, uh, escapes me now. But Mr Leary also said this about climate change in Scotland. If global warming meant temperatures rose by one or two degrees, France would become a desert, which would be no bad thing. The Scots would grow wine and make buffalo mozzarella. <laughs> Presiding officer, when it comes to the future of aviation, we do need to have a serious debate about Scotland, but it should not be a proxy for something else. Uh, and it is a debate which, after September, perhaps we can return to with some seriousness. Thank you very much. Um, and I now call George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. I, I take this debate extremely seriously because Glasgow International Airport is a major employer for my constituency and actually in Paisley. But it's not fully in my constituency, it's in Derek Mackay's. And I've been told by the Minister to make that plainly obvious to everyone in the place. But they're a key employer for our area because of everything new. They're the gateway to Scotland for many tourists and business people. And in a previous life, I know exactly what it's like to try and get from one end of these islands to the other, having to use aviation, because the way Scotland does aviation is more important to us than it is to other parts of these islands as well. But Glasgow Airport has 30 airlines, 100 destinations, and as already mentioned, uh, 7.4 million passengers a year. Now, that's £200 million generated to our economy from Glasgow Airport, and they're still the principal airport for long haul. They also are extremely involved in our local community in Renfrewshire. They've got the Flight Path Fund, which covers Renfrewshire, East and West, and Bartonshire, and Glasgow. And the three key areas that they count with is employment, environment, and education, making sure that many groups get the opportunities to actually uh, learn from some of the things here. So they are a valuable part of my community, and I can only see how they're going, in spite of all this, that they've been working with APD having a damaging impact on the Scottish economy and contributing to the community I represent. Well, it's already been mentioned that APD, uh, if there was a reduction, would actually uh, cost, Scot would, uh, cost Scotland £200 million per year. £200 million that we'd be able to put back into our economy. And also it would give us the opportunity to actually ensure that we could discuss what we're doing about connectivity throughout the world, instead of having to sit here and uh, pay APD twice effectively by going to one of the hub airports. And I think some of my colleagues have already mentioned that some of the problems that are down in Heathrow at the moment, the turmoil that Heathrow have currently got themselves into with regards to their proposed expansion plans and is... Uh, mis uh, as uh, Chick Brodie mentioned earlier on, the problems that uh, we have with the, the Mayor of London, who has a fantasy idea about having a, so, uh, an airport somewhere in the middle of uh, uh, London. So I would say that we've got to look at ways that we can use our ability to be able to get connectivity for our businesses throughout Scotland. Now, one of the things that uh, have been mentioned... Yes, I will. James Kelly. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank Mr Adam for taking the intervention. Just on connectivity in airports, does he now support the establishment of a rail link at Glasgow Airport? George Adam. Presiding officer, can I just say to the Labour group in this, let it go. Let it go and let's move on to actually the proposal, because Glasgow Airport are working with the Scottish Government on other uh, ideas with regards to interconnection with uh, the Glasgow and the surrounding area. So I think it's time for the Labour Party to move on and actually their history in capital spend projects aren't very good, because when you look at the trams that were just announced recently, that was one of their other babies. And also, did they want Garrow to please. actually go into the stage Order. like they had? Even this building here, Order. presiding officer under Labour, went massively over budget. So I won't get told about capital spend by anybody from the Labour Party. So as we say here, you know, when you look at some of the... But not at the moment, thank you. Uh, when you look at some of the, uh, the, the kind of companies that are involved with Scotland and who are backing, some of my colleagues already mentioned, you know, Glad uh, Edinburgh Airport, Gordon Dewar, chief executive, has already said this tax has now hit tipping point where the damage that it is doing to Scotland far outweighs the benefits. Uh, also, Amanda McMillan, uh, managing director of Glasgow Airport, said on the question of devolution of APD, Glasgow Airport has always been supportive of this proposal, given the Scottish Government's more progressive approach to av aviation and its greater appreciation of the role of the industry plays. 
You know, even Liz Cameron of the Scottish Chamber of Commerce says current rates of APD seem more suited to controlling capacity constraints at Heathrow than they do with the needs of regional airports. Devolution of this tax would afford the Scottish Government the opportunity to create an air transport package for Scotland designed to improve our direct international connectivity. There is a group of individuals and people, and even the airlines, you know, Flybeer, a unique uh, example, was already mentioned by one of my colleagues. They actually are a regional airline that are managed to have a unique model uh, within the aviation, but they also are one of the ones that go throughout these islands from uh, covering all our regions and areas. And their CEO recently said today, we welcome today's debate, an important step towards rectifying this taxation, which places us a regional airline at a competitive disadvantage and continues to damage Scotland's aspirations, aspirations for economic growth. Can I just finish this point here? New destinations going hand in hand with considerable more passengers can only mean one thing, growth. And is that not the most important thing, is the growth and investment in our economy, which a lot of the members in here seem to not understand? Alec Johnson. How would the devolution of this tax help Scottish passengers or passengers from Scotland arriving at London to connect with other flights. Surely he understands that the abolition of this tax on a UK basis would be far more beneficial to Scottish passengers than simply devolving it and abolishing George it here. Adam. President officer, Mr Johnson misunderstands my argument. It's about connectivity and direct flights to the world, actually making Scotland part of the world and getting directly there. You know, one of the, the, one of the things when I listen to the, the Road to Damascus speech that I heard earlier on from Mr Johnson with regards to APD. You know, the Calman Commission mentioned that we devolve APD. Lord Strathclyde's Commission said devolve APD. So here we go, promises, promises from the Tories. Why don't they just stick it in the Queen's speech? In fact, why don't you take one of the flights down, pay the APD, and actually say to one of your colleagues down there, why don't you stick it in the speech? And let's see, put your money where your mouth is, Mr Johnson, I would say, presiding officer, so that we could actually have the argument and they could actually do something instead of doing their continual, just all they're doing at this stage is just pandering, trying to be relevant in the current independence debate. Well, this, along with many other things within the, the Scottish Government have promoted, is another reason why we need independence. Independence. And I believe that if we get that opportunity, we can make Scotland connect with the rest of the world and change our lives of people in Scotland. Okay. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches and I call on Patrick Harvey up to six minutes. Mr Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Most of the arguments we've heard about the tax side of this debate, uh, just as with the Scottish Government's approach to corporation tax seem to me to boil down to little more than Laffer curve mythology. This notion that you can take a theoretical graph and from it extrapolate an argument that cutting pretty much any tax is justified in any circumstances. It's, it's cover for an ideological position which I reject. I don't think it's true, but even if it was true, the argument Elaine Murray put forward at one point in her speech is also very clear. Even if it was true that cutting taxes increases revenue, there's a delay effect, and the Scottish Government's budget would take the hit in the short term. The, there are those who might want to, to extend this argument and abolish a whole host of other taxes, no doubt to Mr Johnson's joy, but I, I hope at least that we can challenge this notion that doing so would increase tax revenues. We've had several arguments uh, about this notion of incentivising uh, long-haul connections to replace short-haul connections uh, and that that would have some benefit. We heard that from Mr Adam, who uh, a few moments ago seems to be the, the latest in a list of members who hasn't noticed that we can actually get to London by train. Um, this notion was used by the previous administration, the coalition Labour Lib Dem administration, to justify the Air Route Development Fund as well, and it simply doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Even if additional uh, long-haul flights uh, are, are put in place, that simply frees up slots at airports where the connections would have happened. Those slots quickly get filled up by other long-haul flights, and the increase in emissions continues. That's what happened uh, under the Air Route Development Fund. We saw continual increases uh, in emissions. That's what would happen under this scenario as well. Uh, some have talked about fuel efficiency in aviation as being something that can reduce the emissions 
from the industry. Well, it's true that only fuel efficiency can hold back the increase in emissions that come from increased aviation. It cannot prevent it altogether. Just as we saw on no thank you, just as we saw on the efficiency of cars, which did increase dramatically during the 20th century, the increased use of those cars meant the overall fuel consumption and therefore overall pollution went up as well. That's what's happening with aviation as well. And I'm going to quote from, this is the industry's own figures, this is the International Air Travel Association, saying that fuel efficiency gains have partially decoupled CO2 emissions from expanding air transport services. It says uh, that um, uh, a 1.9% uh, improvement on uh, fuel efficiency, projecting a further 1.7% in 2014. 1.7% uh, uh, in increase from fuel efficiency. That's set against a 5.2% increase in air transport itself. So you've still got an increase in emissions of some 722 million tonnes of greenhouse gases before you factor in the radiative forcing effect. So this, uh, very briefly, yeah. Mike I wonder if you're aware that the solar-powered aircraft Impulse 2 had its maiden flight yesterday, and that along with electric cars, these technologies will ultimately solve, solve a lot of the drawing board as well. Patrick, I, Patrick Harvey. I like the drawing board as well. I'll, I'll be interested to see when that, ha that comes into to commercial operation or any other zero carbon aviation mode. We're limited at the moment by what's available at the moment, what the industry is doing today around the world. And those increases in fuel efficiency will be limited by two things. What's practically achievable and by what's profitable for the industry to invest in. And that no public policy can change the former. The lack of fuel duty reduces the incentive for the industry to invest in more efficient practices and reduce emissions that way. Claudia Beamish was one of many members who talked about the CO2 impact. And I started asking the Scottish Government questions about the CO2 impact of this policy as soon as it was announced. It must be more than two years ago now. 18 months of a delay continually asking after the First Minister had given a commitment that the impact uh, of this policy on carbon emissions would be assessed, uh, 18 months of a delay before we got any kind of answer, at which point the climate change and transport ministers were vacillating between themselves about who was going to answer the question. Two months ago, finally, Paul Wheelhouse confirmed uh, that the SNP's air passenger duty policy would increase emissions. I thought that was the final word, but now, today, it seems that the Transport Minister is rowing back from that again. This simply isn't credible. It does begin to sound, Deputy Presiding Officer, it does begin to sound as though they're just making it up as they go along. And if we're going to take this policy seriously, or any replacement for air passenger duty seriously, we need to assess the impact before the Scottish Government makes its decision. We've heard from others as well that this policy is supported by the aviation industry. Well, my jaw was on the floor at that point. It really was. You, you know, the, the idea of a, of a profit-driven private sector business that doesn't want to pay tax? Whoa! Believe it or not, Deputy Presiding Officer, believe it or not, I am not arguing that we should dig up the runways to plant cabbages. I'm really not. I'm, I'm, I'm arguing but the, the, the air passenger duty damage, uh, damage done by the air passenger duty outweighs the benefits. That's another argument, Mr. Adam advanced. I would say no. If we continue to allow this industry to expand and not to pay its environmental costs, it's the industry which will cause more damage uh, than the benefit it provides. I'm I am saying close. that this is an industry which must pay its share, is not doing so today. I am saying it's an industry which we can't allow to grow forever if we're serious about climate change, and I am saying that our real priorities should be on good quality, reliable, affordable alternatives. Thank Many you. Many thanks. Colin Gavin Brown, six minutes, please. Deputy Presenting Officer, we've had a very, I think, interesting debate today with a range of views from tax being described by my colleague Alex Johnson as a necessary evil. From across the chamber, an argument saying that you have to balance the economic benefit versus the impact on the public finances. Those behind us who are against any reduction in APD on a point of principle, primarily an environmental principle, and those in the middle of the chamber, so enthusiastic, so enthusiastic for the abolition of APD that it must be gone 
at some unspecified point after 2020. It's such a no-brainer. We'll get so much more taxation in that it must be gone at some point after 2020. This presiding officer was classic SNP hyperbole, a classic attempt to try and turn it into yet another debate about the referendum. Because once again, the Scottish Government have complained loudly and bitterly about the powers that they do not have. They do it day in, day out, week in, week out. But they refuse to do anything with the powers that they actually do have. If you look at the taxation powers that they currently have, whether it's LBTT, which is coming into force, whether it's business rates on the tourism industry more broadly, they have done nothing with business rates specifically for the tourism industry. They are refusing to say point blank what they're going to do with LBTT when it comes into force. If they wanted to be credible, if they genuinely wanted to be credible on this, they would demonstrate it with actions with the current powers that they have. I'm happy to, to give Mike McKenzie. Mr. McKenzie. Thank you. I, I, I wonder if Mr Brown would agree with me that that, um, what, what he illustrates perfectly is the inadequacy of any partial devolution because the art of taxation is that you achieve good public outcomes by giving away with one hand and recouping with another. That's the whole point and art of taxation, and that's what the limited devolution offerings of a wee bit more tax here and there don't allow us Gavin to do. Brown. I think what it does demonstrate is the inadequacy of the approach of the current Scottish Government Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm going to come back to this recouping tax with the other hand point, because there is a classic example of SNP spin in relation to this, which was handed to me just a couple of minutes ago. But specifically on airlines, the Scottish Government does have the power over an air route development fund. This was a policy brought about by the previous executive in 2002 that was successful. Now, Patrick Harvey made reference to it in a way that he didn't like, but he did state quite clearly that it was successful both for short haul and for long-haul flights for Scotland. Now, I think it was fair enough to scrap it at least temporarily in 2007. I think the result of the EU ruling made it difficult for it to continue in its current form. However, seven years later, I think had there been the political will of the Scottish Government, they could have found an EU compliance successor to the Air Route Development Fund. What work has been done on it by the Scottish Government? Perhaps the Transport Minister will tell us. What papers have they published, published about the investigation into how it might be done? Let's hear from them later. And let's see what work is currently being done to see that what they could do with an air route development fund, because I think there is definitely scope to do something. But let's come to the point I want to make in response to Mr McKenzie, because every SNP member today, including the Minister, said that it's a no-brainer because you would recoup far more VAT than the money that you get from APD. They have reports from PWC. They say they're not making it up. They have reports from PWC. They have reports from Audit, your please. aviation. And all of them said you would recoup more money from VAT. Mr Stevenson, admittedly saying it was the back of an envelope calculation, pointed out, he said it was back of an envelope, pointing out how you would get more money via hotels and restaurants through VAT. Well, that's very interesting, presiding officer, because I have in my hand a copy of Travel GBI, the number one magazine for domestic travel, tourism and business use across the United Kingdom. And it says this. Is, are we going to collect more VAT? No, because the tourism minister is promising here a tax cut on VAT for all of the tourism yes. and hospitality industry. <laughs> Scotland Tourism Minister Fergus Ewing has confirmed that an independent Scotland could reduce VAT on tourism. We should cut VAT on the hospitality industry from 20% to 5%, Deputy Presiding Officer MSP Graham Day, no wonder he's sitting at the back of the chamber today, said the VAT rate on tourism in Scotland and the refusal of the UK government to cut it is just one of the many examples of why Scotland's interests would be best served by being an independent country. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, let me just the ask this just question. Finishing. By how much would tourism need to increase 
in order to recoup all of the VAT and all of the money from APD that they say they're going to cut within the first few year of, years of independence. Ian Gray said this was a proxy for the independence debate. Yes, it has been exactly that. And they have been found out, Deputy Presiding yeah, Officer, yeah. making promises that completely do not stack up whatsoever. And I think it's about time the Scottish people saw them in their true light. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Colin James Kelly. Seven minutes, please, Mr Kelly. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, it's been a very, it's been a very interesting afternoon. Uh, it started off with Mr Johnson uh, spelling out the evils of taxation. And as I listened to some of the speeches from the SNP backbenchers, I didn't realise that Mr Johnson was so influential. <laughs> <laughs> because, we, because we got, you know, so many Reaganite type speeches uh, against taxation. It's quite clear that this is the afternoon for the right-wingers on the SNP benches. No, no wonder Roger, Christina please. McKelvey looks embarrassed. <laughs> there are three, there are, there are, I think there are three central themes that come out of this debate. The impact on the Scottish budget the attitude of the government to climate change and their sort of central view on transport policy. I think in terms of the Scottish budget, Ian Gray and Patrick Harvey are absolutely correct. If you're going to propose a 50% cut in APD, which is going to take £135 million pounds out of the Scottish budget, then you need to explain to people where you're going to, where you're going to make those cuts. Does that mean that we're going to have less classroom assistance, that we're going to have less, we're going to have less nurses. You need to be upfront and you need to be honest uh, with people about these things. Because if you get, uh, just let me develop this point, Mr Brodie, if you've got Alec Neil at the weekend saying that he wants to get rid of 15 minute care visits, how can you do that when one of the first acts of uh, an independent Scotland for an SNP government would be to uh, cut corporation tax and cut APD by 50%, taking half a billion pounds out of the budget. It's time that we had some honesty. Now, I think the, the whole issue about climate change uh, has been a very interesting one in this debate. Uh, Claudia Beamish made a very substantive contribution uh, in terms of action needed to tackle climate change emissions. And it was interesting that, with the exception of a, a, a brief interlude from Stuart Stevenson, the SNP backbenchers just completely ignored the climate change issue in this debate. It was almost as if, you know, shut your eyes and uh, it will go away. We don't need to talk about that. I give way to Mr Harvey. Patrick uh, Harvey. Thank you. I, I wonder if Mr Kelly's being unfair. We heard from Mike McKenzie that there's a one-seater solar plane that's going to solve the problem. <laughs> James Kelly. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Order. To be, fair to, to be fair to Mr McKenzie, I think he did say that it was still at the drawing board. So <laughs> don't, don't misrepresent his position. It's not, it's not quite taken off yet. Uh, but... Um, Order, please. In, te in, in terms of the attitude to climate change, I mean, it's all very well. Uh, I, was, I was in this chamber when the Climate Change Act was passed, and it was passed, you know, everybody in the Parliament agreed to it, and we all sat and we all clapped away, and there was lots of happy clappers on the SNP benches. But you can't clap away like that and say it's great, we want for a 46% reduction in carbon emissions by 2020. But but, um, you know, we, want to, uh, we also want a 50% reduction uh, in APD. Those two policy objectives uh, don't sit together. And what should really have happened in this debate is the SNP government should have brought in Paul Wheelhouse. He should have answered the debate and he should have answered how the policy of a 50% reduction in APD uh, squares with trying to reduce... Uh, carbon emissions, because it's sheer hypocrisy. I think the third point to touch on is the one 
of the, the wider issues around transport policy and how that affects the airports. A number of people have spoken about the importance of you know, connectivity, and that's something that perhaps the government should have been concentrating on uh, this afternoon. Um, I mean, the, we've got the Commonwealth Games coming up shortly, and we're going to have people arriving at Glasgow Airport, and there's no airport rail link there you know, to take them to the Commonwealth Games uh, venues. It's quite interesting if you look at what's happening uh, at Glasgow Airport, because there's not uh, an airport rail link. What you're actually starting to see is you're seeing a real growth in the number of car parks that are around those airport, uh, are, is around that airport. So what is then happening is that people are driving in their cars uh, to the airport, therefore, therefore increasing uh, carbon uh, emissions. And are not, just, just let me develop this point. Uh, and if there was proper connectivity, if there were better public transport links in place, then people wouldn't need to go to the airport carport car parks and they could reduce emissions. Right, Mr Stuart Stevenson. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I wonder if the member recalls that the study into Garrel showed that it would take 15 cars off the M8 in the peak travel hour. The reality is that money should be invested in ways that are actually effective in getting cars off the road, perhaps even improving the bus services until other options can be made available. James Kelly, and you're in your last minute. Well, it's a, pity, it's a pity that the SNP government chose to pour £30 million of public money from Gar Garrel down the drain uh, instead of investing in a link which could have been a real benefit to Glasgow. What we, what we need in terms of this debate in, in relation to how to move it forward is we need some proper evidence as to the environmental impacts and also the economic impacts. And that will allow us to take an informed position, uh, not only on a, whether APD is correct, but also on the level of APD. As many have said, this is a proxy uh, debate for independence. What we've had from the SNP is they start off with uh, uncosted uh, promises which come forward uh, in the form of cuts to APD, but also not able to square that up with, uh, with reductions in carbon emissions. And that then manifests itself in an all things to all men policy, which, is com which completely lacks in cohe coherence. What we need is a proper and grown up discussion about transport policy and APD. The SNP needs to stop kidding themselves on. You must and I hope close. post September the 18th, whatever the result, we can properly discuss these issues so that we can support transport policy in Scotland's airports properly. Thank you very much. I now call on Keith Brown to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until five o'clock. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, it has been quite uh, a relatively interesting debate, as James Kelly said at the start, and there have been some, I think, very good contributions. I think uh, Mike McKenzie uh, and Graham Day made very effective contributions. Uh, Claudia Beamish also very much concentrating on the side of environmental benefits. But she did mention, of course, uh, trying to improve the prospect of rail vis-à-vis -vis air travel, and I would agree with that point. But the question really has to be, why is it the Labour Party has still not committed to bringing high-speed rail to Scotland? the biggest single development that you see modal shift from air to rail. Still don't support that. I have to say, to be fair, neither do the Conservatives nor the Liberal Democrats, despite their manifesto commitment to do that. But I do agree with many of the points that she made, and also that Elaine Murray made. And I would say in relation to some of the points that she made in terms of either incentivising better fuels uh, or penalising more um, uh, damaging fuels. I think those do have to be uh, dealt with. I think you said this yourself at an international level. That's how they're dealt with currently. I think that's how you'd have to take that forward. And I think that that's a perfectly reasonable point to have made. I don't agree with the sneering approach to the new technology, which uh, Mike McKenzie outlined in terms of the solar plane. These are how these things develop over time, and I hope that certainly succeeds. Um, I think it's also true to say, though, that what we've seen here today is a, a remarkable degree of displacement amongst the uh, unionist parties. Anything but a straight answer to the position that they now hold. <laughs> Even having listened to Alec Johnson in his initial speech, I still don't understand whether the Tories support devolution of APD or not. He started off by saying that the tax is evil, as we've heard, uh, and then said maybe it was uh, a necessary evil. Uh, but he didn't actually say whether he supported its devolution or not. Um, I thought what was really interesting was the attack that he made on the aviation industry, not least when he was laughing along with uh, Patrick Harvey in his attack on the aviation industry, and in particular he 
York Aviation report. Essentially, the point was, well, look at the growth in airports. You're doing all right anyway. You can live with this tax. Kind of undermines uh, Ruth Davidson's uh, speech yesterday when she was talking about uh, uh, devol uh, devolving the tax. Um, it's also true to say that uh, the Tories are really very much all over the place. But what was really interesting, I think, was Gavin Brown's contribution. At one point, he seemed to be arguing for its uh, abolition immediately, uh, one of the questions that he put to a backbencher. Uh, and then he had an incredible uh, question, which I found, when he was challenging what the benefit would be of not charging Scottish holidaymakers going to Florida. What would be the benefit in reducing that tax? Now, this is the party that supports Hayek and Friedman and Keith Joseph. He's arguing for the most punitive tax in the world yeah. uh, to be put on Scottish taxpayers. Yeah, yeah. How does that square with his background of uh, a low tax economy? There will be no benefit, he says, no benefit to the Scottish economy or Scottish individuals in reducing that tax. Well, there would be a benefit. It'd be an obvious benefit, and he might want to think about this a bit longer, be a benefit to the airport themselves, who do increase business by increased custom. It'd be a benefit to the airlines themselves. And of course, it'd be a benefit to the individuals. It's a relatively basic part of tax theory that if you reduce taxes, you can increase economic activity. And his argument that you should have the heaviest possible tax on people trying to go to Florida, and just on that, the price of that, of course, just to remind the Chamber, the same family travelling to Florida for a holiday prior to 2007, £80 they would have paid in APD for the trip. In the summer of 2014, this summer, they'll pay £276 for the same trip. And Scotland will be interested to know that Gavin Brown supports that wholeheartedly. Uh, now, if you go on to some of the points which uh, Patrick Harvey made, uh, if he mentioned uh, the fact that it's a, uh, this is a great benefit to the airline industry, and I think that you, you can't deny there's going to be a benefit to the airline industry, he doesn't seem to acknowledge, never acknowledge in any of his contributions, that this is paid for by passengers. It's passengers that pay this tax. I don't have the experience that Patrick Harvey has of globetrotting around the world on long-haul flights, as he's confessed to the chamber previously. Well, he did do it in the last debate, if you remember. Uh, but I'm sure it's the case that he must realise individuals pay this tax, not the airline industry that pay the tax. And also, he did not accept the point I made that the short... The reduction, yes, I'll give away to Patrick, Patrick Harvey. Harvey. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. One of the arguments I was making, or questions I was putting, is really whether the government is consistent in its carbon assessment of the impact of this policy. Now, just two months ago, we finally got a confirmation from Paul Wheelhouse, the climate change minister, that this policy will increase emissions. And today, the transport minister seemed to imply the precise opposite. Which minister should I believe? Minister. Uh, well, I've actually answered the question earlier on, but obviously uh, Patrick Harvey wasn't listening at that point. I mentioned the fact that we would have £1.3 billion in support to the delivery of measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and also that we have reduced transport emissions in Scotland since, uh, since, since 2007 by 1.7 million tonnes, around 12 per cent. And I've also said, as has Paul Wheelhouse, that we will have a study on this once we introduce that 50 per cent. If we get the opportunity to reduce APD, then of course we have to study the effects of that, and I think that's a responsible thing. Thing to have done. I think it's also true to say the Labour Party, I, I really struggled to work out what the Labour Party's position uh, on this was. I think we had uh, from Ian Gray um, the idea that this, he actually went on at some length to describe this as a bad tax, riddled with inconsistencies, riddled with anomalies. It was no longer an environmental tax, but his solution is to leave it to the people that invented it to try and deal with that. Well, I think we can make a better job in Scotland of dealing with that. And it's also true to say, in the same way as they've had the inconsistency from the Conservatives, Calman, yes, then nothing happens for five years. Ruth Davidson apparently says yes, but no intention to do anything very quickly on that. And as was quite rightly said by George Adam, there is no reason why this can't be contained in the Queen's speech tomorrow. If you really believe, and I'm sceptical myself, if you really believe this tax should be devolved, this can be done tomorrow. Whether it's by train or by plane, you can go out onto your people in Westminster and make sure that happens. The simple fact is that both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats and, of course, the Labour Party agreed under Carmen this tax should be devolved. And what's changed in the meantime? What has been the big difference? Why has it not happened? Why the inertia on the part of the Unionist parties? I think it was different people, admittedly, Wendy Alexander, Annabel Goldie and either Tavish or Nicol Stephen. But why has nothing happened in relation to this? And it's that ignoring of the real demand that's out there. There is the uh, airline industry demand, if I can just finish this point. The airline industry is demanding this, but there is real concern amongst people that have seen the cost of their air, air travel go through the roof for a tax which everyone acknowledges has nothing to do with the environment and all about revenue raising. I'll give way to Gavin Brown. Gavin Brown. What work has the Transport Minister personally done in the last couple of years in examining 
the Air Route Development Fund, a power which he currently has. No, well, I, I could certainly go through the different meetings that we've had with the airports and with the airlines and the documents which we've produced to try and speak to people about that, but to try and wish away the fact that this Air Route Development Fund was abolished. Well, you just think, you don't believe that we've had those meetings then, is that your point? Uh, uh, the simple fact is he knows that Europe said that this was no longer possible to do, and trying to ignore that just leaves him without any credibility in the points he's trying to put forward. Uh, and also we have the Liberal Democrats who are so weak on their position in relation to this, they try to turn it into a debate about childcare benefit. I mean, and then disappear for the entire debate with no Liberal Democrats here. I think that shows the weakness of the uh, unionist parties in relation to this issue. The idea, is not just, the idea this is just about the airline industry rather than individuals is completely wrong-headed. If you talk to people, they know they're paying extra for this. They know they're paying the highest tax of its kind in the world. It's a fairly straightforward thing to resolve. If the parties around here uh, believe that this should be devolved, and that has been your position at various points, although it has changed, you can very quickly resolve this. Just get on to your colleagues there in Westminster. Uh, we have the quotes from Michael Moore saying he supported it. We've had the quotes from people in the Labour Party saying they supported it. We've had the quotes from the Conservatives. Just get on to them. You can sort this tomorrow. That will be a real example of the way that the union can work, as you believe, for the people of Scotland. Get on the, get on the phone and get that sorted out today. Despite all that you've said, you've done nothing. People don't believe you. Just in the same way that you invented the figures last year, last week, to try and impress people that it was going to cost £2.7 billion for the start-up costs of Scotland, and then it was found out you'd, exam you'd magnified those by 12 times, totally discredited by the words of Professor Dunleavy. So you're also failing to serve the people of Scotland. It's a fairly straightforward thing today. You said you supported it. APD should be abolished. It's absolutely perfectly deliverable. Get on the phone and get it changed. I move the motion in my name. Yeah. That concludes the debate on air passenger duty. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. Um, can I just uh, say to members, before we go to decision time, can I remind members that in relation to the debate, if the amendment in the name of Mark Griffiths, sorry, Mark Griffin is agreed, the amendment in the name of Alex Johnson will then fall. And whoever's got the mobile phone on, could they please switch it off, please? You can tell the person who went red in the face. Um, right, there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. Uh, the first question is amendment number 10185.2 in the name of Mark Griffin, which seeks to amend motion number 10185 in the name of Keith Brown on air passenger duty be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes down. The result of the vote on amendment number 10185.2 in the name of Mark Griffin is as follows. Yes, 29. No, 63. There were 13 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question then is amendment number 10185.1 in the name of Alex Johnson, which seeks to amend motion number 10185 in the name of Keith Brown on air passenger duty be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 10185.1 in the name of Alex Johnson is as follows. Yes, 17. No, 88. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10185.3 in the name of Patrick Harvey, which seeks to amend motion number 10185 in the name of Keith Brown on air passenger duty be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. Result of the vote on amendment number 10185.3 in the name of Patrick Harvey is as follows. Yes, 4. No, 101. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. <clears throat> the next question is that motion number 10185 in the name of Keith Brown on air passengers due to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10185 in the name of Keith Brown is as follows. Yes, 62. No, 44. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. A point of order from Patrick Harvey. Presiding officer on a point of order, and I apologise for not having given advance notice uh, of this point of order, which arises as a result of the air passenger duty debate that we just had. I should say I'm very aware that matters of veracity are not a matter for the chair, and I'm not going to ask you, presiding officer, to judge on the accuracy of a statement. But we heard today from the Transport Minister that the impact uh, in climate change terms of the air passenger duty policy has not yet been assessed. On the 1st of April, in topical questions, the Climate Change Minister gave a figure uh, for the climate change impact of the policy on air passenger duty uh, and gave a clear indication that that assessment had been made. Given that we have two clearly contradictory statements from ministers, under our standing orders, what is the best approach for my discovering the accuracy, uh, not by asking you to judge on that, what is the best approach for my finding out which of these ministerial statements is in fact true? The member is quite right. The issues of veracity are not for me as the presiding officer. The, minister, the member has also been here for a very long time, so he knows what mechanisms are open to him. Um, that can be done by either a written question, it can be done by an oral question, or it can be as a letter to the ministers themselves. That ends um, decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.